if you're not speaking, could you just make sure you've got your microphone, on. your microphone switched off just so we eliminate any background noise? That would be great. Um, so yes, yesterday was was a, a feast for all of us. It really was. Um, you know, we organize these things thinking it's nice to just get people together and just remember why we're in academia or we have been in academia or we will be in academia. Um, but then it always ends up being something much more than that. And by some sort of magic, um, threads and parallels and contrasts and echoes start to emerge between papers. And that certainly happened yesterday. So um, I personally really enjoyed it. It is four days. It is turning a little bit. If it's a feast, it's turning into a bit of a Lesemian, Lesamalima feast. Um, so I will just like to reiterate that there's no obligation to have your camera on. There's clearly no ob obligation to be here for the whole thing unless you'd really like to. Of course, you're very welcome to do that because we understand that staring at a screen or just being online for a long period um, can be extremely tiring. But um, obviously, that's up to each of you. Yesterday, we made a, sh well, Miriam Palacios made a short announcement about um, ways of sending assistance for medical equipment to Cuba, given all of the difficulties of the com combination of the pandemic and the blockade that Cubans are experiencing right now. Um, we can put that link into the chat if people didn't get it from yesterday, or you can always email me and I can send you the link um, or email Miriam if you have her email and you can she can send you the link. So that was yesterday's um, plea or request to all of you that if you'd like to feel that you're contributing something because it's a very difficult situation as we heard throughout the day yesterday, um, that's probably the safest and most responsible way of doing it in a collective sense, in a sort of um, structured way. Today, and I'm just going to pass over to Tony, we have another request. We're not going to spend every day asking you for money, but here's the request for today. Tony, are you there? I am. Um, yeah, it is a request for um, an element of crowdfunding. I say crowdfunding, but you are the crowd. Um, because the uh, final guitarist who we uh, who came our way and we arranged uh, the one who's playing on the very last element of the whole conference on Friday, Ahmed Dickinson Cardenas, turns out to cost a little bit more than we had uh, budgeted for, um, and the university will certainly not fund a guitarist. Um, so what we're going to do is, hey, if anybody is willing to chip in. Just simply, at the moment, tell me their willingness to do so. And once we've paid him, I will then, depending on how many people have actually said, yes, by all means, can count me in, I will then get in touch with people and say, look, it turns out to be X amount of money for each of us. Um, so any offers welcome. And I'll be repeating this tomorrow and Friday as well. Okay. So if you could just put your willingness to pledge something um, in the chat, we would really appreciate that. And I, Liam, I will remember to note it down before the chat disappears. Well, Liam's taking note of that. So that's Oh, right. Good. Thank yeah. you. Right. Well, you know, it's, a, it's that kind of situation that as much as, um, yes, it's very important to fund the medical supplies for Cuba, but at the same time, um, a musician working in our very capitalist context can also find it very difficult to make ends meet during the pandemic. So... Um, Obviously, uh, you know, it's a plea from the heart, which we wouldn't normally make, but we really do appreciate it. That's fantastic. Liam, you'll have to catch up with that chat. That's really beautiful. Thank you so much. Okay. Can I just ask one question? Sure. Yeah, I just wanted to know, Tony, if we put our, if we type in the chat, would you know that it's me typing it? Or do I have to put my yes. name? No, your, na your name, well, your name always automatically appears. Oh, okay. Thank you. Fantastic. So Liam's taking a note of that. Thank you so much. We will repeat it, um, as Tony said, tomorrow the day after so that everybody gets a chance to contribute. Um, Jackie's got a question in the chat. Jackie, the recordings will be put up when the entire conference is over, just because they're quite long days, um, especially when we're trying to do a bit of work in the mornings. So um, when we are all, probably next week, um, Liam and I will get together and we'll make sure that it's all uploaded to YouTube. Equally, as we keep announcing, um, there are some quite a lot of written papers, Word documents and PowerPoints 
um, which are currently on the Cuba Research Forum Google Drive, but I think it's probably only courteous and because of data protection to ask the authors um, if they are willing to share those, most are. So if you want a PowerPoint from a particular day, above and beyond what you see in the recording, please let me know and I will check with the authors, okay? We're already getting, I'm compiling a list of requests of that kind. So if you could email me that, that would be a lot more permanent than putting it in the chat. Okay, I feel a little bit like a teacher when I say any more questions or if not, we'll get started, but I think we should probably get started. So um, if you remember from yesterday, thanks to my terrible timekeeping, we didn't have time for Arnold August. So we're going to start our first session today with three papers on Cuban history. Stephen Wilkinson, who's about to start. Nice to see you, Samuel, thank you. Stephen Wilkinson, who's about to start. Um, Luis Bofil del Pino, who sent a Word document and an audio recording. And Kenya Herrera, who sent a Word document and a very short audio recording. So what we're going to do in the case of Bofil and Herrera um, is that I'm going to put the link to their Word documents in the chat. You can just click on that link and open the Word document and I will play the audio recording because we had some problems with that yesterday. Okay, or if you just want to close your eyes and listen, um, that's fine as well. And in the case of Kenya Herrera, um, it's just a five minute audio. So her paper won't take the entire 20 minutes, but you will have the entire document at your disposal. And then after that, obviously, that makes time for us to give Arnold his 20 minutes. So we will have Arnold at the end of this particular panel. I hope that's clear with everyone. So without further ado, I am inviting Steve, Stephen Wilkinson, to start our session on Cuban history with his paper. Thank you, Steve. On Juan Gualberto Gomez and the ideology of a raceless Cuba. Over to you, Steve. Thank you, Pa. I'm going to hopefully share my screen. Um, can you see the paper? Yes. Oh, excellent. So this, um, I've got 20 minutes, Pa, have I? Yes, you have. Right, so if I read this, it should take 20 minutes. I'm pretty certain I've timed it fairly well. Okay. Um, so the title, as people know, is Juan Gualberto Gomez and the Ideology of a Raceless Cubanidad. It's a pretty broad title. I, I, you, you'll see what it's about as we go through it. In, in the pantheon of Cuban independence heroes, Juan Gualberto Gomez is a neglected figure. Not a martyr, he fought with the pen rather than the sword. Gomez was a civilian journalist who survived prison and exile to live to a ripe old age and achieved recognition in his own lifetime. This might explain why he's less well known than other heroes such as Maceo and of course Martí. And this is curious because the contribution that Gomez made to both the struggle for Cuban independence and for racial equality are certainly crucial, if not as great as that of the other two. Some might consider this as an exaggerated claim. However, Gomez was the organizer and leader of the Partido Revolucionario Cubano while Martí was in exile. Among his achievements was the establishment of a network that successfully carried out a secret correspondence with Martí and established a colony-wide conspiracy of independentistas that coordinated the internal uprising to coincide with the landing of the revolutionaries in the East in 1895. It is arguable, therefore, that without him, the Second War of Independence might not have happened. Moreover, within the colony, Gomez fought and won a court case to defend the right to publish articles in favor of separatism that meant that polemics, hitherto censored as seditious, could be circulated. This victory led the then Captain General Pola Vieja to comment that with it, the Spanish had, quote, abandoned the means to sustain our sovereignty over Cuba. For these two achievements alone, Gomez deserves greater acclaim. It is true that in Cuba today, he is commemorated by having the airport in his native Matanzas province, which serves the Varadero Beach Resort named after him, and the town of his birth has also been given his name. The Union of Journalists has him as their patron, and a bust of Gomez stands outside its headquarters on Avenida 23, in Havana. 
But this is a post-59 official recognition. Prior to the revolution, Gomez was relatively unknown, a fact that prompted his daughter, the historian Doctora Angelina Edriera de Caballero, to publish a biography of her father in 1954 on the centenary of his birth. In the preface, she comments that a public opinion survey taken in Cuba that year showed that Cubans, although they knew his name, knew little about her father's contribution to the independent struggle. Outside Cuba, Gomez is less acknowledged, even in histories that deal with the issue of race. For example, Hugh Thomas, in his seminal history, Cuba or the Pursuit of Freedom, fails to acknowledge Gomez's achievements, incorrectly refers to him as, quote, an ex-autonomist, and even manages to get the year of his death wrong as occurring in 1930 and not 33. Richard Gott, in his New History of Cuba, does say that Gomez was the leader of the Revolutionary Party in the island and, quotes, collaborated with Marti in organizing the war. But he fails to point out uh, that in Marti's absence, Gomez was the leader of the movement in the island. He even mistakenly refers to him as a general. Later, Gott describes Gomez as being, quotes, middle class and rather dismissingly says that he promoted the black cause in Cuba, quotes, only through education and integration. This attitude he contrasts with the more radical and separatist views of other leaders of color, such as Rafael Serra and Evaristo Esteñoz, to whom he devotes rather more attention. This inclination towards radical black separatism in the early Cuban Republic is most notably foregrounded in Aline Helg's highly regarded Our Rightful Share, The Afro-Cuban Struggle for Equality, 1886 to 1912. It is worth analyzing Held's treatment of Gomez in some detail. Held's periodization is telling. 1886 was the year in which slavery was finally abolished in the island, and 1912 is the year of the so-called race war, in which the Cuban army massacred an estimated 4,000 black and mixed-race Cubans, many of whom were innocent women and children. These were Cubans who had risen up in eastern Cuba under the banner of the Independent Party of Color, founded by Esteñoz, to whom Gott devotes more time than Gomez. The dates neatly bracket independence, which occurred in 1902 after four years of U.S. occupation following its intervention in the war in 1898. As the title implies, Helg's concern is to, is to explain how black Cubans lost out from independence, which under the influence of the United States, and despite it granting full suffrage to all Cubans white and black, nevertheless marginalized blacks from the political process due to an overwhelming white racism that was not sufficiently challenged. Hell glades some of the blame for this on Gomez because he was an advocate of racial unity in the name of which he eschewed pressing black rights out of a fear of provoking white racism. Indeed, she states that Gomez refused to support the Esteñoz rebellion on the basis that it threatened the nation and quotes the doctrine of fraternity between the races. Helg refers to Gomez as being privileged and says he only managed to attain a position in white liberal society because of his quotes, broad Western culture. The suggestion is that his connection with white liberals somehow co-opted him and led him to promulgate views on African descended Cubans that actually played into commonly accepted myths upon which white racism was underpinned. Chief among these myths was the fear that African descended people would establish a black republic like that in Haiti, which would bring about an exclusion and, as happened at the end of the ha Haitian Revolution, a massacre of the white population. Helg summarizes articles written by Gomez in response to the intensifying use of the threat of another high tea by the Spanish authorities as evidence to support her claim that he, quotes, unwittingly even promoted prejudice. Gomez's reasoning is as follows. He argued that whites had nothing to fear because the circumstances that brought about the Haitian Revolution were not present in Cuba. Cuban blacks were predominantly Creole. They were not imported and had been born in the colony unlike the majority of the slaves that had rebelled in Haiti. Moreover, the majority of Cuban, Cuban African descended people came from tribes that were less warlike than those that were imported into Haiti. Most importantly, Gomez argued that the numbers made the two cases utterly dissimilar, whereas the ratio of black and mixed race to whites in Haiti had been 20 to one, the, in Cuba, the ratio of whites to African descended was two to one. 
This perfectly, these perfectly logical premises, Held describes, are defensive reasoning rather than a refutation of the premises upon which white racist propaganda was based. Furthermore, because Gomez advocated that Africans should seek education and lay aside syncretic religious beliefs, Held argues that this played into reinforcing stereotypes of African barbarism that were used in the white racist press. The argument then becomes one that supports the idea that the Cuban unified raceless or race blind nation, which African descended leaders such as Gomez promoted was itself a myth. For Held, Gomez's desire for a Cuban nation in which all races belonged was doomed because it fails to oppose white racism forcefully enough. Thus, her explanation as to why the African descended population massively supported the War of 1895 is because Spanish colonialism epitomized discrimination against them, not because they actively supported and were integral to the separatist project. The underlying attitude to this approach is one that sees the relationship between the African descended participants in the independent struggle as being at worst dupes and at best as being naive because they did not deal with the potential for racism to split the ranks of the movement. So, for example, Maceo's decision to accept that Maximo Gomez should be the supreme commander of the forces because to have a mulatto in charge might have played into Spanish hands is an example of the fatal compromise that these African descended leaders made. Helg's attitude is unconsciously revealed by a careful reading of the way she describes the relationship between Martí and Gomez, which portrays Gomez as a subordinate and a cipher rather than as an equal collaborator. She points out that in 18... In 1894, Gomez published a photograph of Martí in his newspaper La Igualdad with an editorial praising Martí and his commitment to racial unity. She then disingenuously says that, quotes, before this issue appeared, Martí had secretly designated Juan Gualberto Gomez as the coordinator of the independence movement in Cuba. In fact, Gomez was the leader of the Partido Revolucionario de Cuba on the island since its exception two years earlier. Held then writes the following, Martí's choice of Juan Gualberto Gómez rested as much on practical as on ideological reasons. Martí was aware of Gómez's remarkable organizational skills and persuasive powers, as well as his island-wide connections with thousands of Afro-Cubans committed to Cuba's independence. He also thought that, as a mulatto and a journalist of modest means, Gómez would be less likely than any prominent separatist to be suspected of coordinating the movement. Finally, Martí saw in Gómez, whom he described as the son of a slave who knows how to love and forgive white Cubans for past mistreatment and as a leader who did, quote, not demand special and foolhardy rights for Cubans of color, a man who shared his views on the future of race relations. This is questionable on a number of grounds. Firstly, to say that Martí chose Gómez misrepresents the relationship between the two men. Martí and Gómez were close friends. They had met in 1878 and had formed an immediate and strong bond of friendship that continued from then onwards. They had both arrived at the same conclusion that a Cuban Republic would have to be one in which all those who identified as Cubans, regardless of race, would have to share equal rights. But each had reached this conclusion from their own experience. How far Martí learned from Gómez and Gómez learned from Martí is debatable. But what should not be misunderstood is that each man knew the other intimately as comrades, rather than Gomez sharing Martí's views, it would be fair to say that they both shared each other's. Secondly, following from this is also a misrepresentation, it is also a misrepresentation to say that Martí chose Gomez for practical reasons, as if he would not have done so had there been an alternative candidate who did not possess the advantage of being a mulatto of modest means. No reference from Marti's reasoning is offered as evidence for this assumption, and it is doubtful that there is any. Yes, it is logical that Spanish white racism was a reason the authorities underestimated the capacity of African-descended people to organize, and this worked to the advantage of the independentistas. However, the truth of the matter is, as Helga herself reports, that Gomez was the, the head of a massive movement, thousands strong, of clubs across the island composed of African descended Cubans descend, dis dedicated to independence. Indeed, far from being less prominent than others, Gomez was in fact extremely well known, 
having fought the court case in defense of his separatist views only a few years earlier. He was the founder and editor of two journals and the author of scores of articles that had circulated in the island for decades. To suggest that Gomez was not under suspicion by the authorities is actually ridiculous. The fact of the matter is that in spite of his prominence, Gomez was able to carry out his political activity in secret because he could rely on <clears throat> the support of African descended Cubans. As his daughter writes, the correspondence between Martí in exile and Gomez in Havana was kept secret because of the activity of African descended devotees. These letters did not land in the hands of the Spanish because Martí addressed them to a humble woman of color. Inside the envelope would be another that read, for the neighbor. These letters would be collected by a young black called Jorge Herrera, who would hand them to Juan Gualberto. And after he had read them, they would be guarded by a mixed race tailor called Ramon Hufaril. When one observes the chain of events, it is proved that the secrecy of this correspondence was maintained because the Spanish government could not conceive that it depended upon such humble people belonging to the most disdained class of Cuban society, the black race. This places an entirely different emphasis. Here, the struggle is presented as a collective effort that indicates just how strong the separatist ideal was among African descended people. And this, I think, is logical. Given the racial demographics, if, Cuban, if African descended Cubans embraced the idea of an independent Cuba, it would mean it would have to be inclusive. The idea of creating a black republic could never be a practical aim. This would also logically mean that the new Cuba would also include whites, many of whom would be racist. It seems, therefore, impossible to imagine how African descended Cubans could not understand that they would have to accept and tolerate the problem of racism within the white population, at least until whites could be educated out of it. It implies, therefore, a need for forgiveness. This then brings us around to Marti's view that Gomez was a son of a slave who knows how to love and forgive. Helg says this was to forgive white racism and adds that he saw Gomez as a leader who would not make foolhardy demands for special rights for Cubans of color. This again is a rather disingenuous citation. The two quotes are removed from context and are not from the same text. One context of the love and forgive quotation is an article that Martí wrote on the occasion of hearing that Gómez had been admitted to the very prestigious liberal intellectual society, La Sociedad Económica de Amigos del País, in 1892. In this article, Martí both congratulates Gómez and also celebrates the fact that this elite club of European descended Cubans had admitted an African descended Cuban for the first time. Martí does not say in the article that Gómez was someone who would not make foolhardy demands, and the context conveys a different meaning to that which held construes. Singular is the valor of the new member of the Economica. He knows how to love and forgive in a society where forgiveness is greatly needed. He loves Cuba with that love of life and death, that heroic, that heroic spark with which it is necessary to love in these days that tests those who love it truly. He has the insistence of the journalist, the energy of the organizer, and the foresight of the statesman. But our happiness is not only for the justice that is being granted to a distinguished Cuban, but also for the concern that is eliminated through the desire of this noble person for the betterment of social relations, of the races of Cuba towards natural justice that would explode if they were not given opportunity, and that this cordial recognition of merit is a happy announcement that the mistaken men of Cuba on feeling the heavy weight of oppression upon their heads, may understand and love those Cubans who are more oppressed than they are and with, and with whose help they have to raise the nation. Steve, you have about three minutes left. Okay. Um, this suggests a more correct way to understand Marti and Gomez is to be attuned to the way they link the struggle for independence with the struggle for racial equality, universal manhood suffrage, and a nationality that transcended race. As Cubans, the African descended confronted discrimination by emphasizing their patriotism and consolidating an identity around their Cubanidad rather than denying it and seeing themselves as distinctly African. This tradition survived even the race war of 1912 and explains why African descended Cubans have consistently emphasized their Cubanidad and opposed racial separatism. As Lawrence Glasgow, in his comparison of the thought of W.E. Dubois and Gomez points out, the development of a national identity that transcended race was Gomez's fervid goal. 
His strong sense of Cuban identity is, in, is encapsulated in the statement, we are all Cubans and nothing more. This response has persisted to the present and has survived even the special period when racial divisions in Cuban society were exposed. Um, Held is correct to point out that Gomez's hope was only partly fulfilled, that Cuban blacks did not obtain de facto equality either in 1898 or 1959 is undeniable. However, they did win independence for the nation at the same time that they won de jure equality for themselves. It is a sad fact that few blacks won national political positions that, and those that did were often sinecures with little responsibility. This caused Gomez to become disturbed by what he termed the sad realities of the day. However, he persisted in his position of urging African descended Cubans to remember that they have a free fatherland, although it is incomplete, although it is full of imp imperfections. He concluded that with continuing progress, racial barriers will fall, like the biblical wall of Jericho. The cynical will comment that the barriers have yet to fall, but it is hard to deny the patriotism that African descended Cubans still display. The remarkable cohesion of Cuban society is a consequence of the African descended Cuban's conscious understanding that despite the recalcitrant racism that exists, there is no Cuban nation without them. The Cuba that is, is theirs. And Gomez, as much as Martí, is its ideological father. End of. Thank you very much, Steve. Thanks. That's fantastic. So um, if you want to stop screen sharing, we'll go back to our normal screen. I'm and we have to about... do that. Uh, oh, you've done it. That's it. I've done it. Yep, you've done it. Oh, okay, good. Fabulous. So we've got about eight or nine minutes for questions. So over to you out there in the public for questions or comments. You can put your hands up. You can use the chat. So, Alpha. Uh, Steve, thank you very much for um, for this um, expose. Like last year, it was absolutely brilliant, and I really like the fact that you 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 really insist on 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 making sure that this idea um, of of race and the black uh, descended Cubans, African descended Cuban, did participate truly magnificently in the struggle um, for independence, and and not just Maceo and, and Gomez, uh, but this Gomez as well. Which um, I must admit, I don't know. I, I mean, I, I, why is it that he has never been um, rated as Maceo and 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 Maximo uh, Gomez? What what is the reason behind that? Um, given that all this thing that he has done, um, but Marty was in exile, as you say, he was the one in in Havana, um, taking care of the party and 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 keeping this correspondence with Marty. So therefore, he played a very 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 important role. But why is it that history has actually turned a blind eye on him? That's 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 a mystery to me. Yes. Um, well, that's the reason why I've I've done the paper really, and the reason why I've been exploring these these issues, um, Alpha, uh, because of the apparent oversight or neglect. Just to go back to your first point, um, what I'm actually really saying, and what I'm trying to say is that the idea of Cuba itself, the idea of a Cuban nation, is actually a black idea. That, you know, it's, it's if you think about the fact that the white population is divided between uh, those who adhere to a white supremacist colonial attitude and those that wish for a liberal, I, you know, liberally liberal-based um, uh, uh, independence uh, along liberalist uh, lines, um, then they are exclusionary um, of the slave population in actual fact, at least at the beginning. They come around to the idea of incorporating blacks. But black people have been rebelling for a long, persistently from the moment they arrived because they were enslaved. And enslavement means that they had to fight against enslavement and being therefore deracinated, taken from, forcefully taken from their um, African uh, roots and uh, planted in a new world, 
they had to accommodate themselves and create an identity for themselves which rooted them in the new place they were in. So they had to create an idea of Cubani dad for themselves. They, they saw themselves as being Cuban. And I think they saw themselves being more Cuban earlier than white people did. And I think there's a logic to that. So I think that the, the revolutionary movement in Cuba actually owes itself to the black population more than the white population. And I really think that that's what Marti actually recognized. Um, so without the blacks, the independence movement could not have happened. They were the backbone of it. And it was their secret organization, which Gomez led, that developed the uh, movement in the 90s um, underground. So uh, uh, my argument is much more that, that, they that black people just participated. I think that they were the basis, actually, of it. And I think that's the way we have to see it. Now, I think that some of the problems are this vexed issue about racism. And I think that, um, you know, you can't deny that there is there aren't racist people in Cuba. There definitely are. And we had evidence yesterday, of course, in the papers about agriculture, which showed that <clears throat> there was there is discrimination still. So we can't deny that that's the case. But we have to then ask the question, as well as the one you're asking, why are some people neglected and others not? We also have to ask the question why it is that black people still overwhelmingly support the revolutionary project, even though they know they have suffered discrimination even under it. Right. And again, it comes back to, uh, I believe, uh, this fact that they see themselves as Cubans um, in a way, much in a much more profound way in some respects than, than we give recognition to. Right. Well, thank you very much. Okay, we have time for a very brief question and a very brief answer or a very brief commentary from anybody. Does anybody want to make any last comments? May I add something? You may. I'm Enrique Sacerio Gari. Enrique, nice to see you. Nice to see you. I am one of the translators of Esteban Morales' uh, Race in Cuba. And I've had a lot of contacts with uh, many activists in Cuba on the race question. And what I would like to add for, for the reason for the erasure of Juan Gualberto is first of all, and you have to take it by periods, the greatest repression took place right after the War of Independence, which led to the guerrita in 1912 that put a lot of fear into Cubans, by Cubans, and while Gualberto tried to play a different role, he was not associated with the Stenos and so forth. So that is a marvelous call uh, against them. Then with the triumph of the revolution, Jose Martí became the intellectual leader. And as you know, that is an emphasis, or maybe even overemphasized by by many responses to that uh, super emphasis. So in a sense, when you have right now with the return of, or the surfacing of racism during the special period, when it became very clear uh, that uh, the desire to have a discourse on race was going to be suppressed when it was even more needed, uh, it, it brought back the memory of that 1912. You know, Gloria Rolando's work, uh, the, her documentaries on the, on the 1912 revolution, coinciding with the centennial, kind of like brings about that the, you know, the struggle continues and that Juan Gualberto, even though, you know, and I agree absolutely with what you said about Juan Gualberto, it's still that, contributes to the erasure in, in the historical context. And, uh, you know, I would, uh, but he, he 
I mean, you might recall from Edelmira's uh, book that there was this, uh, I really, I'm not an expert on him, but I, I am acquainted with it. I remember a reading that when they came to Marti's house to arrest him in 79, he was having lunch with Juan Gualberto. And they came at the door, his wife came, they're coming for you. And he basically went out and they took him away and he kept completely quiet about the fact that Juan Gualberto was there with him. Otherwise, they would have arrested him. Yes. So, and from that moment on, they never saw each other. That's right. And he's the one he chose to send the message from Key West to start the revolution. So, That's you know, right. I agree completely with you. My intervention is just to add a little bit to this, to this uh, very unfortunate, totally unjustified, you know, uh, forgetfulness of Juan Alberto's work. Thank you, Enrique. Um, Steve, I'm not sure if you want to uh, respond. If you do so, could you just be very brief? Sorry to be such a... No, I mean, uh, I, I absolutely everything that's just been said, I, you know, I absolutely agree with. And um, yeah, thanks very much, everyone, for listening. I really appreciated it. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. So I think what we're going to do is we're going to um, give priority to the live person here today, and that's Arnold in this panel. Arnold, would you be willing to go now so that we just make sure that we don't cut you off again, and then I can play the two recordings when, when you are finished? Does that seem okay with you? Now you can hear me? I can hear you perfectly. We can hear you okay. perfectly. Okay, thank you very much. First, I'd like to uh, uh, congratulate Tony and Parr for organizing this uh, uh, really great event with a wide variety of views in very difficult conditions. And as the ambassador said yesterday, and a type of event that is very much needed given the current situation in Cuba, which is still unfolding. My presentation, less than 60 minutes, the title is, you see it on the back of me, it's in Spanish, but in English is how a young Cuban TV journalist challenges the US centric notion on generational perspectives. Now, the US never carried any illusions that the historical Cuban leadership will succumb to US pressure and thus increasingly targets the youth as the preferred option. The only hope for the US and its allies is the younger generation. This is why Fidel pointed out in 2007, I quote, if the young people fail, Everything will fail. Harsh words, yes, but I think they are true as a series of events in 2020, 2021, and still in unfolding actually illustrate. The Cuban youth are heterogeneous. It is potentially vulnerable to succumb. Why? Cuba is only 90 miles from the U.S. Annexationism is part of the political landscape, however, however marginal it may be since the 19th century to date. U.S. culture and values can infiltrate the psyche of the Cuban youth more effectively than youth in other revolutionary countries, for example, uh, Venezuela, Nicaragua, and of course, China. Now, the U.S. Has a, has a history, U.S. has a history targeting the island's youth provoke a revolt against the Cuban government. However, let us provide a recent example of the so-called San Isidro movement. Its main instigators in Cuba, the international mainstream uh, media and the US government portrays the San Isidro movement as rebellion of young artists against the Cuban government for a supposed violation of freedom of expression. Yes, they are young. However, they are not artists, excuse me. An international media storm and the U.S. government in support of the San Isidro erupted in November 2020. It carried on for several uh, months after that. The target, Cuban youth. However, how did Cuba combat this? Cuba has a wide variety of television news pro programs that have developed since 1959. There are currently many talented young television journalists and presenters. However, 
in this paper, we will um, uh, however, in this paper, we will, we will be concentrating on uh, one. However, um, his name is Humberto Lopez. This is my example. He stood out during the Cuban counterattack against the San Isidro, using his profession as a lawyer and to, to the utmost, as well as his obvious ability to master social media and modern TV technology that the Cuban television places at the disposal of its journalists. Lopez is 35 years old. He has developed his reputation among TV audience through programs such as Buenos Dias uh, of Canal Caribe and in general Cuba Television. His now famous program, Hacemos Cuba, that is May Cuba, which, is, which was in the forefront of dismantling the disinformation about San Isidro in 2020-2021. This started in August 2018, this program, after the referendum of the reform constitution. His regular shows on San Isidro began after the San Isidro incident in November um, uh, 2020. One of the one of the instruments Lopez employed to deconstruct San Isidro narrative is the Cuban Constitution. He explained he le his legal training and experience in analyzing the live online analyzing live on television <clears throat> the Cuban Constitution allowed him to explain an important point about the Cuban Constitution. This consists of the relationship between freedom of expression on the one hand, and on the other hand, respect for the constitutional order. However, this issue is not unique to Cuba, where many constitutions and systems have set similar guarantees of freedom, but with limits. For example, the US Constitution in its preamble indicates the famous one, we the people of the United States, blah, 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 ensure domestic tranquility. Now, I, this, this struck me in reading it again at this time, because the Cuban government and press defend themselves, and rightly so, for acting against violent, provocative incidents, because among other reasons, they say, they challenge the domestic tranquility. However, for the U.S. ruling circles and both their parties, domestic tranquility means the safeguard and rule of the capitalist system. The whole world was a witness to this once again during the George Floyd movement. That is, how the entire state apparatus bore down against the rights of the people to express themselves against racism and the whole system. Now, the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution uh, stipulates, among other points, that, I quote, Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech or the press. Okay. Now, however, what happens in the U.S. when the freedom of speech and expression defies the preamble of domestic tranquility? We know it predominates. In the First Amendment, it also stipulates that the people have the right to peacefully assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Even this is arbitrary. Nothing is easier for the U.S. state and corporate media to declare that demonstrations are violent, even though they have no other choice, these demonstrators, but to demonstrate in the way they see appropriate. For example, the ex-police officer, Derek Chauvin, was arrested and tried only after the demonstrators burned down the police precinct in Minneapolis. Thus, in the US, freedom of expression and the press is circumscribed in many ways to maintain the status quo. For Cuba, domestic tranquility means the right of Cuba to develop uh, the social system of in peace and tranquility. So defending the status quo is also the case in Cuba. However, what is the status quo? Even though it is in perpetual state of change and, and attempts at improvement, the status quo is, is socialism and sovereignty in the face of U.S. aggression. This is Cuba's status quo. Now let us look at the Cuban constitution as Lopez explained it on many occasions in light of the San Isidro. Lopez places Article 54 on the Cuban TV screen. The state, quote, this article said, the state recognizes, respects, and guarantees people 
freedom of thought, consciousness, and expression. Consciousness, conscientious objection may not be involved, invoked with the intention of evading compliance with the laws or impeding another person from exercising their rights. He then ju juxtaposes this article 54 with another article, article 45 of the Cuban constitution which stipulates the state recognizes, respects, and guarantees people freedom of thought, conscience, and expression. Conscious, conscientious objection may not be invoked with the intention of evading compliance with the law or of impeding another from exercising their rights. Over a period of several shows, he illustrated with photos, videos, videos taken by the San Isidro themselves, their own social media, headlines and articles from the so-called independent pro uh, Isidro media. His, he, uh, in addition, he added his own legal argument to highlight irrefutably the most important point. And it is this, the goal of San Isidro is not as they profess to discuss with the Ministry of Culture. Their only objective is to provoke incidents, get attention, and then scream repression to the corporate media, of course. They're always addressing the international corporate media. Attempts, attempts by the Ministry of Culture, uh, and this was clearly shown uh, on Cuban TV, attempts by the Ministry of Culture to discuss in a civilized manner were rejected by the leaders of the uh, of San, San Isidro. Let us just take one incident that Lopez exposed. This was filmed. I'm explaining the best as I can. The Minister of Culture, Apidio Alonso, and Vice Minister, Fernando Rojas, were just circulating among the crowd gathered in front of the Ministry of Culture, striving to get them into the building to discuss. However, rather than accepting, one of the leaders of San Isidro aggressively pushed his cell phone toward the face of the Minister of Culture. Now, what was Apidio Alfonso's reaction? I am quite sure it would, be, it would be the same as anyone else in any part of the world. He, of course, pushed the intruding hand and cell phone away from his face. Did this aggressive act of the uh, San Isidro leader not violate Article 45, which stipulates that the exercise of these rights cannot evade compliance with the law or impede another from the exercise of their rights? The rights of the Ministry of Culture were, were they not violated? In any case, over and above the legal argument, the San, San Isidro individual acting in such a way against a government official, or for that matter, any Cuban revolutionary, amounts to an affront against the Cuban revolution and the very dignity of the Cuban people. When I saw on social media this video of the fam famous slap, I tweeted like spontaneously in reference to Al uh, Alonso, soldier of the revolution. Now, I've got a lot of support amongst the Cuban revolutionaries. Now, is the CM, the, is the San Isidro individual who acted in such a way in front of the Ministry of Culture? Now, who is he? He is the so-called independent journalist, Mauricio Mendoza of Diara de Cuba. Humberto Lopez indicated with proof, proof on this and many occasions that the uh, San Isidro consists of mercenaries. Now, the Ara de Cuba received from the CIA-backed National Endowment of Democracy over $1 million over a five-year period from 2016 to 2020. Talk about independent journalists. Nevertheless, El Manotazo, or, or the slap, as it was to become known by the dissidents, went viral on social media. The term shows up on hundreds of occasions in Google. This was the desired effect and will surely earn the Diario de Cuba continued CIA support. However, the much hoped for result in Cuba, that is of provoking an uprising, especially among the youth and artists, in support of freedom of speech and press supposedly being violated against the government, did not work. There was, there was never really a chance that it would 
take hold in any substantial way in my view. Nevertheless, the youth in Cuba is heterogeneous and so are young artists. And then there are all, is also a section of independent intellectuals and commentators in Cuba among the older generation who contribute to the narrative of suppression of freedom of speech. Now, uh, Humberto Lopez, he, he became a household name. You know, I guess the San Isidro were hoping that the, 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 the martyrs who were supposedly on hunger strike, that they would become a household name, but there was Humberto Lopez who completely reconstructed that whole uh, uh, San Isidro uh, movement, he has become a household name. Now, the, the work of Humberto Lopez contributed toward keeping the damage to the minimum, that is, keeping the influence of the San Isidro movement amongst the youth and artists. They, they, did he manage to keep this to the minimum? It is quite possible if we judge by the hatred in the Miami press and the dissident social media against him. He was also the victim of physical provocations. We have not witnessed such an outpouring of character assassination against a single journalist in Cuba in quite some while. The frustrated, frustration exhibited by the San Isidro was perhaps fueled by the fact that Lopez is from that very generation that the U.S. and its allies in Cuba had been hoping to win over against the government. Cuban youth can easily identify with him as uh, uh, with him as a result. Uh, as one of my Cuban colleagues mentioned in a phone, telephone conversation a couple of days, days ago, in preparing for this paper, what my colleague said, and it comes from a multi-generational uh, family living in the same house, that uh, Lopez attracts your attention. He motivates all ages and not just youth. And he goes on to say, my colleague goes on, on to say, that the importance of Humberto Lopez is his youth, but also lies in his arguments, facts, concrete points that refute with tangible elements what is said outside of Cuba uh, with regards to what is happening at that time. Now, when Fidel he was, uh, was optimistic, after saying in 2007, if the young people fail, everything will fail, he also declared in a very next sentence, it is my profound conviction that the Cuban youth will fight to stop that. I believe in you. Now, uh, at this time, is, is, uh, what was, Fidel was very optimistic. Does this hold at this time in 20, 2020, 2021? I actually have my doubts. I think that the Cuban youth is heter heterogeneous. So are the Cuban artists. And one cannot underestimate the damage done by the older generation, so-called uh, independent intellectuals, etc., who are pushing the following line that they are against the violent provocations, but they're also against the Miguel Diaz Canal. So there is this is still an ongoing thing, and I, uh, I'm sure everyone has opinions on what is happening in Cuba. And I, and on that point, and uh, ask people to engage myself and others in discussion about this whole question of uh, resistance to the U.S. attempt to use intellectuals, artists, freedom of expression to develop a movement against the Cuban government. Thank you. Thank you, Arnold. So we do have um, about five minutes or so for questions and comments. I think there may be quite a bit of debate. So if you could try and be as brief as possible, um, if you want to raise your hand or, or identify in the chat that you want to speak. I guess while we wait for people to uh, collect their thoughts, um, You've said an awful lot there, and a lot of what you've said will, for some people at least, be relatively controversial. And that's because you keep using the word heterogeneous about youth, and you're absolutely right, but you also have identified Cuban cultural actors as very heterogeneous. And um, I think if I understood correctly, towards the end of your paper, you were laying some responsibility at the feet of an older generation of what you called independent intellectuals 
for having stoked the fires of um, resistance or protest or whatever it is amongst uh, younger generations. Could you say a little bit more about that? Uh, well, the, the narrative is as follows. Um, you have, uh, soon after this took place, uh, the, of course, the mainstream media, whether it's uh, the San Isidro or the current events uh, following July 11th, they, they have a mainstream media have a list of go-to people. That is people uh, who are either Cubans living in Cuba or Cubans outside of Cuba, uh, mainly, for example, uh, intellectuals or, or whatever. And the basic position is that what we call both sideism, uh, uh, that is, the, we do not agree with the uh, physical provocations of San Isidro, or we do not agree with the uh, physical pro uh, provocations of the SOS uh, Cuba movement in uh, uh, July 11th and 12th. But at the same time, uh, we have to recognize that Miguel Diaz Canal uh, uh, used a, uh, a political repression uh, against the demonstrators. Of course, it comes across that, you know, against both extreme, but that narrative actually helps the mainstream narrative of color revolution against the Cuban government. Uh, because when, when one speaks in this way, what comes across is uh, the, the guilty party is the Cuban government far more than those who committed uh, acts of vandalism, etc. And uh, this is you know, repeated time and time again, and there's other factors as well, which we don't have time to go into now, and that is especially uh, lately with the uh, more, well, both San Isidro and July 11th, the use of the race card by uh, those who oppose the Cuban government. And uh, we don't have time to go into to now, but uh, I'm looking into it, and hopefully I will have something on that at a, a separate uh, and another occasion, but you know it, it's important to note those uh, some so-called left movements uh, or left outlets in Canada, United States, and elsewhere. They are actively pushing the race cards, saying that you know you, Cuba is racist. You know, <laughs> Steve uh, indicated very clearly that elements of racism exist. No one can deny it. But some of these left. Uh, outlets actually say that Cuba is a racist state. So you have all of these different elements coming out, converging with each other, and are putting uh, the Cuban government in a very uh, difficult situation. That is why I say it's important to take into account that youth is heterogeneous. You know, it's not like the workers and factories and unions. Heterogeneous because uh, they are coming from different generations. Uh, they are not uh, as um, well uh, uh, entouré uh, by uh, by the Cuban system, and more easily influenced by social media. Uh, in a recent uh, webinar uh, in Canada, Ero, Ero Sanchez spoke, and he has a lot of experience in that. He pointed out how, for example, in the current situation. Uh, the Cuban youth, because of the pandemic, uh, they were not able to attend school for a long period of time. And thus, they spend more time on social media and, you know, being a, thus uh, creating a situation that whereby the Cuban youth would have more access to the uh, San Isidro or July 11th narratives against the Cuban government. And it's creating a certain amount of, uh, uh, of, of confusion. Thank you, thank you. You said a lot there. Um, I'm just wondering, there are there is time for maybe one comment or one more question. Does anybody want to make a comment or ask a question? It looks like not so. Arnold, thank you so much. Thank you for your patience. Thanks for your paper. Thanks for your thoughts and your reflections. You've given us a lot of food for thought. Um, thank you very much. Okay, so we are going to move on to um, to quite different uh, a different topic, um, probably linking more to Steve Wilkinson's paper. Uh, we're going to start with uh, Luis Bofil del Pino. This is back to our history section, um, who's a researcher in the Instituto de Historia, and he has a paper about Maria Luisa, um, let me just hold on, trying to multitask, Maria Luisa Dolce Arango, 
a uh, Cuban educator who, according to his paper, was ahead of her time. So you can see in the chat that I've put a link in there. So what I'm inviting you to do is to click on the link, open that in a different window. You don't need to be online, in to, and sorry, you don't need to be visible in this Jitsi meeting. And in the meantime, I will play the audio for that. Okay, so it's not, I don't think following the paper exactly, but it is more or less uh, a version of the paper. And at some point in the next minute or so, I would be grateful if somebody could tell me that they can hear this. Saludos para todos los oyentes. I can hear it. Excellent. Thank you. Fingers crossed. Les habla Luis Bofil y a continuación presentaré la ponencia María Luisa Dors y Arango, una mujer adelantada a su tiempo. María Luisa Dors, la educadora, como se le conoce, fue una destacada intelectual, profesora y promotora social cubana que defendía los derechos y la educación de la mujer. Nació en La Habana el 4 de octubre de 1854 en el seno de una familia acomodada que no se sentía identificada con la política colonial, siendo la quinta de nueve hermanos, pero la mayor de las hembras. Proceder de una familia de intelectuales le permitió recibir una educación integral extendida a su hogar, complementada con clases de lenguas extranjeras, literatura, arte en general, y se perfeccionaba en el conocimiento de las ciencias. Muchos de estos saberes le valieron para que en años posteriores obtuviera certificados de estudios de esas materias. Casi al cumplir la edad de 12 años, María Luisa aumentó sus estudios en el Real Colegio de Instrucción Elemental y Superior para Señoritas, entre 1866 y 1869. En sus notas sobresalientes ya se vislumbraba la tamaña e inteligencia de una mujer que trascendería en su época. Pero su hábito por aprender no solo se ceñó a los saberes que la escuela le ofrecía, con mediación de clases particulares, con el maestro. Martín Funes aprobó las materias de matemática y contabilidad mercantil en los años 1869 y 1870 respectivamente. Su disposición por el magisterio se reveló desde la niñez. El hogar fue testigo de esa actitud, teniendo en sus hermanas menores, Julia y Adelaida, a las primeras discípulas. La visión de la ilustración de las mujeres se proyectaba en ella desde edades tempranas, por lo que no es casual que todos los conocimientos que adquiría quería transmitírselo a sus consanguíneas. En 1872, apenas siendo una adolescente de 18 años, comienza a impartir clases en el Colegio de Señoritas Nuestra Señora de la Piedad, dirigida por María José Ruiz. Según cuenta Pastor Río, repartía pródigamente el plan de la enseñanza a muchas jóvenes de su amistad, sin remuneración alguna. Siempre estaba superándose a sí misma no se conformaba con conocimientos y labores a media. Su alto interés por la faena educativa la llevó a graduarse en 1876 de maestra de instrucción primaria elemental. Al año siguiente, 1877, obtuvo el título de instrucción primaria superior, alcanzando excelentes calificaciones. Su vasta cultura y vocación por la enseñanza propició que se desempeñara con éxito en el magisterio. El 10 de noviembre de 1879, la dos adquirieron la propiedad de un centro educacional ubicado en Prado y Colón, con el nombre de Isabel la Católica. Ese mismo año comienza a dirigir el que sería el más prestigioso colegio exclusivamente para niñas y señoritas durante el periodo colonial. En esta escuela pone en práctica muchas de sus ideas de ilustración para la mujer, elevando el intelecto de sus estudiantes y preparándolas para una posible vida fuera de las cuestiones hogareñas. El claustro de profesores fue variando con el paso de los años y contó con relevantes nombres de la intelectualidad del país. Entre ellos se encuentran Enrique José Barona, Alfredo Miguel Aguayo, Rafael Montoro, Carlos de la Torre, Ramón Mesa, Lincoln Saez, Salvador Salazar, entre otros. Y es digno de apreciar la presencia valiosísima de mujeres muy cultas que gozaban de gran reconocimiento social. Resaltan los nombres de Mercedes Matamor, poetisa y escritora, Adriana Bellini, de mucha popularidad en el mundo artístico y literario, Pilar Romero, María, María Dolores Guerra, entre otras. En su centro realizó una destacada labor docente que, por sus innovaciones, llegó a ser conocida a lo largo y ancho de toda la isla. Igualmente por proporcionar a sus educandas una sólida preparación. Un discurso del doctor Alfredo Aguayo lo certifica. El Colegio Dors estaba tan bien graduado como las escuelas oficiales 
y tanto su plan de estudio y su disciplina como el profesorado y la técnica de instrucción no tenían nada que envidiar a las mejores escuelas del Estado. En esta institución, la educanda inició una revolución en la instrucción de las niñas y jóvenes que matriculaban. Rompió con los moldes de las escuelas parroquiales que solo enseñaban religión, normas de comportamientos patriarcales que se atribuían a las mujeres de ese periodo y labores relacionadas con el hogar, incorporando en el plan de clases materia científica, asignaturas de debate y reflexión, enseñanza de idiomas, trabajos manuales, educación física y lecciones de bellas artes. En el programa curricular, ella articuló toda su doctrina pedagógica en función de su orientación y activismo social. Su objetivo era fortalecer la educación femenina y construir un nuevo modelo de mujer, una mujer moderna. María Luisa, al escribir cada uno de los textos básicos de las materias a impartir en su escuela, se propuso descolonizar la enseñanza de los obstáculos que suponían los métodos de estudios escolásticos y memorísticos introducidos por las autoridades coloniales. Por medio del campo de la experiencia y la ciencia, pretendía incorporar a sus discípulas el razonamiento y la investigación como mecanismo certero para adquirir conocimiento. Para la dulce, un buen aprovechamiento del saber se consigue siendo reflexivo, aplicado, disciplinado y bien instruido. Desde el año 1881 se comienza a practicar en el colegio la calistenia, una combinación de ejercicios físicos y gimnasia rítmica. Estaban a cargo de profesoras cubanas que lo habían aprendido en los Estados Unidos. Ella defendió esta asignatura de los detractores que asumían el deporte como una práctica perjudicial y barbí para la figura femenina. Esta actividad no visibilizaba en la docencia femenina, le valió que fuera la primera mujer cubana en incorporar clases de educación física y juegos corporales en su instalación. Y en consecuencia, su colegio tuvo la primicia de ser el único en impartirla en largo tiempo. La educadora otorgaba anualmente 12 becas a niñas pobres y huérfanas, brindándoles la oportunidad de estudiar, admitiendo algunas de las recogidas de la sociedad protectora de los niños. Muchas de sus alumnas obtenían galardones en la distribución de premios del colegio y participaban con sus creaciones en exposiciones internacionales, destacando su talento e inteligencia. Su carácter decidido propició que aconteciera un hecho insólito que catapultó su carrera profesional, la introducción en su institución de los estudios de bachillerato para mujeres. En su discurso del 16 de diciembre de 1885, pronunciado en los exámenes generales de su escuela, anuncia la noticia de la aprobación de la segunda enseñanza para su plantel. La segunda enseñanza para mujeres constituía un requisito indispensable para que ellas fueran admitidas en la universidad. Es decir, graduarse de bachiller en la institución Isabel la Católica permitía acceder a la educación universitaria a la de género femenino. Al currículo de María Luisa Dolce se le suma este importante suceso, no solo porque fue el primer colegio de señoritas del país en obtener esta condición, sino porque constituyó un eslabón para el acceso a los estudios superiores para la compañera del hombre. María Luis Sado fue conocida por romper todos los estereotipos. Aunque era una mujer de fe religiosa, no consta en su trayectoria ningún acta de matrimonio, por lo cual no tuvo un esposo que controlara sus movimientos ni sus bienes materiales. No tuvo hijos de su propio vientre, pero se adoptó una niña a la cual educó, amó y fue heredera de todo su patrimonio. Fue una mujer independiente de decisiones propias y alto intelecto, razón que le permitió ser la primera mujer cubana en dominar muchos espacios que solo eran diseñados para hombres. Contrario a las actividades que debían ser adecuadas para mujeres, la Dolce siempre estuvo imponiéndose retos y aplicaba para su vida los objetivos que tanto defendía, la educación y los derechos para las mujeres. Sus estudios no solo quedaron en los niveles primarios, en el Real Colegio de San Fernando cursó en 1884 todas las asignaturas del plan curricular de la segunda enseñanza con un notable aprovechamiento y puntualidad. Esto le valió que, para años más tarde, solicitara con insistencia que se le concediera alcanzar los exámenes de suficiencia para el bachillerato, proeza que logró el 24 de mayo de 1888. El 14 de junio de ese mismo año, se le otorga el título de bachiller en arte para el rector, por el rector de la Universidad Literaria de La Habana, constituyéndose como la primera mujer en obtenerlo con notas sobresalientes. Su gran meta fue acceder a la Universidad de La Habana, 
y lo logró. Su camino ya estaba labrado desde septiembre de 1882. Fue presentándose a los exámenes privados convocados en la Universidad de La Habana, cursando asignaturas como minerología, botánica, geometría, geometría química general, zoología general, análisis matemático, ampliación física, anatomía, fisiología, geología, entre otras. Es de esperar que a la altura del año 90, 5 de marzo, obtuvo el grado de licenciatura en ciencia, sección de las naturales. Fue una de las precursoras femeninas cubanas que se graduó de estudios superiores. Gran conocedora de las ideas más avanzadas de su tiempo, estudió la obra de renombrados pensadores y científicos del mundo, como son Charles Darwin, Emmanuel Kant, Teodoro Ribot, Herbert Spencer, Alexander Bain, entre otros. Se convirtió en la primera mujer en obtener el grado académico de doctora en las ramas de las ciencias naturales en la Universidad de La Habana en el año 1899. En su tesis doctoral expone su análisis de la teoría evolucionista, evolucionista de Darwin, relacionándola con la enseñanza de la moral. Fue una mujer muy activa, con un discurso claro y revolucionario. Dictaba conferencias, redactaba artículos para la prensa nacional, siendo la temática principal la superación y los derechos de la mujer. Exponía en sus alocuciones que una enseñanza integral femenina contribuiría a una formación más completa de la mentalidad de muchas mujeres, propiciando así el despertar de una conciencia feminista. Sus transformaciones en el campo de la educación generaban las bases para la lucha por las reivindicaciones sociales del más llamado censo débil. En 1874, con la edad de 20 años, ya se estaba pronunciando a favor de la instrucción de la figura femenina y expresa, no os convenceréis de cuánto es capaz la mujer, no pensaréis hasta dónde podría llegar a cultivarse esmeradamente su inteligencia manifestándose en el mismo discurso enunciado en la escuela donde partía clases a los que se oponían a ese derecho a severa. No puedo menos para apartarlos del error en que muchos se hagan de que es perjudicial o al menos inútil ilustrar a la mujer que seguir en mi designio de probaros la influencia que ella tiene en la sociedad. La apertura de su colegio y sus actividades pudieron desmentir ese error de que algunos hablaban. Celebró con júbilo la apertura de la educación superior para las de sexo femenino a la altura del año 1883 y en un discurso divulgado en 1885 expresa Hoy brilla una de las eras más notables en la historia de los derechos de la mujer. Se nos abrieron las puertas de las universidades y academias que en tan injusto título estaban monopolizadas. Se le abre campo para brillar lo mismo en la ciencia que en las artes. Poco a poco se daban los pasos para lo que posteriormente se llamó liberación de la mujer y María Luisa no paró de utilizar su pluma y su voz para defender los derechos civiles y educacionales de ella. De ahí que se reconozca a la educadora como pionera en el ámbito feminista de la isla. A través de la ilustración de la mujer promovía un feminismo social, es decir, un soporte a la mujer por medio de la educación afirmaba que la mujer tenía definidas sus propias capacidades y que sus funciones estaban dirigidas a formar a las nuevas generaciones y funcionar como un ser activo incorporado a las labores de la sociedad sin ninguna diferenciación con el hombre. Desechaba toda pretensión de que la mujer estaba diseñada para servir al hombre. Ella es cierta de sus hijos y del conocimiento que eliminan de su conciencia la ignorancia y la desidia. Su obra cumbre en este periodo relacionada con el tema de feminismo y justicia de los códigos. En ella expone el avance del movimiento feminista de Europa y de los Estados Unidos y pone en tela de juicio el lento desarrollo en que se estaba gestando el de Cuba. En cuanto a la mujer trabajadora tuvo también sus apreciaciones. En un artículo titulado Desventajas de la Obrera denuncia la explotación a la que es sometida la mujer asalariada y demuestra cómo al campo laboral se traslada la condición de inferioridad con la que es mirada la del sexo femenino con respecto a la figura masculina. Dice, los sueldos de las obreras no alcanzan la de los obreros, aunque realicen el mismo trabajo, en el mismo tiempo y con las mismas condiciones. Es decir, porque la mujer es más débil, porque gasta quizás más energía que el hombre para obtener igual producto de su actividad, se les remunera menos. En 1899, como ya había terminado la dominación española en la isla, 
que comenzaría a formar una nación propia y las mujeres estaban a la expectativa para ver qué lugar representarían en este nuevo escenario. María Luisa Dolores, ese año, no dejó de pronunciar su discurso donde dio herramientas para la preparación de las de género femenino en la nueva sociedad que se construiría. Asume a la mujer como la formadora de las nuevas generaciones que integrarán el naciente gobierno. Al no incluirse en la Constitución de 1901 los planteamientos femeninos que le proporcionarían una mayor independencia, nace una república donde las mujeres no son tomadas en cuenta. Por tanto, el discurso femenino se radicaliza y reclama transformaciones efectivas a su situación jurídica. María Oreza Adol fue una de las intelectuales que estuvo a la cabeza de este nuevo fervor feminista, siendo una de las más grandes pensadoras de ese proceso. Mario Alves Adol fue una fiel defensora de las reivindicaciones femeninas. Sus ideales no solo quedaron expresados en papel y defendidos a través del Estado público y la prensa, llevó su labor a la práctica. Con su colegio de señoritas sentó las pautas para ilustrar a la mujer cubana, elemento que le que las prepararía para poder reclamar efectivamente sus derechos de igualdad con respecto al hombre ante la sociedad. Introdujo en su escuela disciplinas y prácticas pedagógicas inadmisibles en la superación curricular del mal llamado sexo débil, batalló para que fueran aceptadas y ellas disfrutaron de la gimnástica en los estudios de segunda enseñanza y los superiores en la universidad. Se convirtió en la primera maestra cubana en obtener menciones honoríficas en universidades y academias, y academias extranjeras. Abogó por la creación de una escuela cubana y luchó por el mejoramiento de las condiciones de los centros educacionales populares. Favoreció la superación del profesorado. La educadora, a pesar de tener una amplia y trascendental obra intelectual, no cuenta con la gran divulgación que ésta se merece. Al estudiar ese pensamiento eh, cubano de todos los tiempos no hay presencia de un texto de esta destacada pegadora todas las lecturas hacen referencia a escritores masculinos ella no solo habló de la educación y feminismo, también escribió sobre ciencia, historia universal los males sociales, derechos civiles la guerra patria, cómo construir la nación, entre otras temáticas es justo que se analice y promueva su ideario como el de, los gran, como el de las grandes figuras coloniales Cito a Varela, José de la Luz y Caballero, José Antonio, José Antonio Saco, todos hombres. Esta mujer fue olvidada por el tiempo, sin embargo, no pudo ser silenciada en su época. Muchas gracias. Bueno, eh, le damos las gracias a Luis Bofil. Eh, él es parte de un grupo de trabajo de investigación del Instituto de Historia que se enfoca en la mujer. Y entonces vamos a pasar enseguida... Eh, a otra ponencia, eh, eh, la grabación, el audio es mucho más breve, son cinco minutos nada más, de Kenia Santa Herrera Izquierdo, y es sobre la unión laborista de mujeres durante la lucha antimachadista. Breves apuntes. Voy a primero, perdón, voy a primero poner eh, el enlace al, al escrito y después vamos a escuchar la, la grabación. Un momentico. Ok, aquí va el enlace. Pueden abrir el documento, pero les advierto que el audio de Kenia son solo cinco minutos. Así que pueden, yo creo que sería mejor leer el texto después y ahora escuchar el audio. Un saludo fraterno desde La Habana, Cuba, para participantes y organizadores del evento. Mi nombre es Kenia Herrera y en esta ocasión en la sección Historia Cubana presenta el tema de la Unión Laborista de Mujeres, pues es esta una organización femenina que tuvo un destacado papel dentro de la vanguardia revolucionaria de los años 30 del periodo republicano en la lucha antimachadista y junto al proceso revolucionario que estaba caeciendo. Sería esta una, un, una organización 
heterogénea en su composición de mujeres de la época entre las que se encuentran estudiantes, maestras, intelectuales y obreras. Esta organización trabajará junto a otras como directorios estudiantiles y de abogados, el Partido Comunista, Defensa Obrera Internacional y otras sindicales. Dentro de sus actividades estuvo el socorro a los trabajadores y estudiantes víctimas de la persecución en la cárcel, a los que va a ayudar económicamente y a proporcionar defensa legal. También se encargaron de ayudar enviando víveres a las comunistas y presas políticas de la cárcel de Nueva Gerona y de Reclusorio Nacional. Esta es una organización que va a tener también un carácter auspiciador en la conformación de varios estudiantiles, eh, varios directorios del periodo. Entre estos podría decir el directorio radical de abogados y el directorio... Eh, de, de, de la escuela normal y también eh, logró unir mujeres y hombres, o sea, ambos sexos dentro del el director estudiantil universitario. Otras actividades pues estuvieron encaminadas a ofrecer conferencias y mítines para crear estados de conciencia en la sociedad para lograr la unificación del pueblo cubano en la lucha por su liberación. Recuerden que estamos hablando de un periodo donde eh, está regido por la dictadura del general Gerardo Machado. Y prestaban también apoyo a las luchas proletarias de momento. De esta última, por ejemplo, tenemos acá durante el periodo que van a estar denunciando constantemente los abusos a los que estaban expuestas las obreras eh, cubanas que eran muy explotadas durante el periodo. Y bueno, por todo ello, eh, por todas estas cuestiones que les he comentado, pues sus miembros tuvieron que actuar bajo la clandestinidad en muchas ocasiones y también lidiar con la constante amenaza de los delatores al servicio de la dictadura y de las autoridades machadistas. A estas revolucionarias se les eh, quiso impedir la participación en la oposición a toda costa. Van a ser, eh, en muchas ocasiones, van a sufrir pre, eh, persecución, cárcel, en disimiles oportunidades, muchas de sus miembros, y también se van a ver forzadas a exiliarse, como es el caso de su presidenta, Ofelia Domínguez Navarro. Eh, en el transcurso de la lucha, asumieron nuevas actividades que propiciaron su radicalización, eh, una ideología de izquierda, y que esta se verá reflejada además en la nueva denominación que dan a esta agrupación a partir de 1933, eh, que se va a denominar Unión Radical de Mujeres. Esta organización va a estar eh, abogando en todo momento por los derechos de la mujer durante el periodo y también aparejado, bueno, pues eh, va a estar dentro de toda esta lucha contra el régimen que estaba cadeciendo durante el periodo. Bueno, aunque no se puede abarcar todo eh, por el espacio, bueno, pues espero que haya sido de su agrado esta pequeña intervención y espero que puedan consultar en su momento eh, la ponencia que eh, les dejo eh, escrita. Bueno, un saludo para todos. Y gracias por la atención prestada. Buenas, buenas tardes para todos. Ok, bueno, muchas gracias porque yo sé que Luis y Kenia, que son amigos muy fieles del fórum, van a ver el video en YouTube. Entonces, Luis y Kenia, muchísimas gracias por sus trabajos. Eh, como ya pueden ver, eh, lo, el público tiene acceso a sus documentos y cualquier pregunta que tengan, cualquier intervención o comentario, 
eh, estarán en, en contacto con ustedes. Entonces, yo creo que vamos a hacer un pequeño descanso de uno o dos minutos porque vamos a cambiar de tema y vamos a pasar a la siguiente, al siguiente panel. So we're going to start in about two, two or three minutes with our next panel and we will go to the live person, the live um, speaker, Jeffrey González. Jeff González from Florida International University. Our panel is about religion. So we'll start with him. He will be speaking live and then we'll have two contributions from Havana on religion, um, very similarly to the way that we've just done it, okay? But first, let's just have a couple of minutes break. So we'll be back in two minutes. All right, let's see how I get this up and running. Okay, I think we're ready to start again. So this is our panel session six, Religion in Cuba, La Religión en Cuba. And Tony is gonna chair this one. I am indeed, thank you. Um, right, let's just get started. As Pa said, and it's just in case you haven't got the papers in front of you. We start with Jeff Gonzalez, Jeffrey Gonzalez, Florida International University, but also doing, I know, doing a PhD in Reading, University of Reading. And his paper is on the Orisha Diaspora, Yemaya, Mother of the Waters. And we'll start with that and then continue to the next two papers, which, as Power indicated, are again short, well, not short, full length uh, recordings of maximum 20 minutes each. So we will have time for Jeff's questions straight after Jeff's paper. Okay. Away to you go then, Jeff, all yours. Good morning, good morning. Does everyone see my PowerPoint? Um, no. Um, 
Yes, I yes, agree. yes. Yes, yes. Yes. Yes, I can. Okay. I think Tony might be the only one who can't see it. Uh, that's possible because uh, I'll, I'll believe you though. If you, oh, it's, could, who knows? It could be because my background or something like that. Who knows? Anyway, go, away you go. Regardless. All right. Thank you, Tony. Good morning, everyone. Yeah, I'm here in Miami. I'd like to thank Parr and Tony, the center and the University of Nottingham for this opportunity. I'd also like to recognize that Professor McAllister is here in this conversation, one of my excellent dissertation advisors at the University of Reading. My presentation today is about the Lukumi tradition and specifically the Lukumi tradition as is expanding into what I consider to be a global Orisha diaspora. And I'm using the image of Yamaya, who is the mother of waters, as kind of a proxy for this type of expansion. Um, briefly, I, I'm going to define the Orisha diaspora as a global community of Orisha worshipers that practice one of the three major strands of Orisha, be that Yoruba land, uh, traditional, the Cuban Lukumi system, or the Brazilian Candomblé system. In, in, reference, in reference to the three major strands, it's important today to note that practitioners of any of these strands may not be of African, African Brazilian, or African Cuban descent. It has become much larger. I would also like to make a brief clarifying note that I use the word Lukumi for the Cuban tradition. The two other more common terms are Santeria, which is considered a pejorative term among practitioners as they're not really saint worshipers, and Regla de Ocha, which came out of the School of Anthropology in the beginning of the, the 1940s in Cuba, which implies some type of monastic rule like the rule of St. Benedict. And Orisha worship is much more complex, much larger than a rule, and it's very individualized. So with that, with that being said, I, I'm going to do a brief history of how the Lukumi arrived in Cuba. The, the Lukumi arrived in Cuba mostly during the 19th century. A, after the decimation of Oyo in 1803 that lasted almost 1820, many of the West Africans that were in the Oyo territory or neighboring territories such as the Abado were taken as slaves to Cuba. Uh, in Cuba, they organized themselves and recreated their traditions within the Cuban framework and started to practice what today we call the Lukumi tradition. Um, well known in this aspect of recreation is the Vacabildo that was located in San Jose Ochenta, which is believed to be the place where the greatest amount of elders got together and created the system we have today. Today is September 8th, which is La Caridad de Cobre for all Cubans. Um, also, Lukumi practitioners celebrate today como fiesta de la Caridad de Cobre, but Lukumi practitioners also celebrate today as La Fiesta for Yemaya, meaning that um, yesterday was La Virgen de Regla, our day of the rule, Our Lady of the Rule, um, where the Lukumi would have public events, and today, the 8th of September, were the private events that incur occurred inside of the religious homes. So expanding the presence of the Lukumi, after the revolution of 1959, there was an exodus of um, Lukumi practitioners off the island of Cuba. By the time the Cuban revolution, revolution arrived, the Lukumi practitioners were in all of the socioeconomic strands of Cuban society. And early on, uh, New York, Miami, and Puerto Rico became three of the spots where the greatest amount of Lukumi practitioners lived, visited, and started to practice. Um, to give you an idea, in 1961, the first full initi initiation occurred in Puerto Rico. So basically two years out from the revolution, 62 in New York, 63 in Miami. This, this is important because these were the first time that full initiations occurred outside of the island. It was also the first time that folks outside of Cuba 
really started to practice the Lukumi tradition. This is a great example of how that expansion of the Lukumi tradition has now interacted with other traditions across the globe and started to integrate some of the aspects. What you're looking at is the Ogun Leki statue. It is being carried by the Aruba uh, in Nigeria, and it is being carried by Alma in New York City. The Egbe Omoye Maya is a Lukumi community in New York City that has an annual festival on the 7th of September to the beaches of New York. Uh, actually, Broadway Beach, and um, through through relationships between Africa and the United States, a statue was commissioned where both of them are Ogunleki, and they celebrate these in conjunction between the two the two places. J just one example of how the Orisha diaspora is starting to grow, and how the Lukumi system is growing and integrating. Invigorating and reinvigorating the Lukumi system on the island. One of the things that I think was very important and, and um, was the change in the Cuban constitution in 1992 that opened the way for a more, for more public religious expressions. Um, this was the changes that occurred on the island and there was a change to several of the articles in the constitution um, allowing for a more secular society. This is of course during the special period which created an opportunity for Lukumi practitioners to expand their practices. It also saw a time of increased religious tourism that has really continued almost through the beginning of the COVID era. And it established in a very strong way, a web of transnational communities that came back to the island, um, developed stronger ties with the island, and started to influence the Lukumi practices both on the island and off the island. Um, one of the, the most important parts of this was the recreation of public events in Cuba. And with that, I want to focus on La Procesión de Yemayá, <clears throat> the Cabildo de Yemayá de Regla, re-established the annual street fair uh, procession in Regla in 2015. The, you have two pictures right now. One is from 1961, which was the last time La Procesión um, went out, was publicly, uh, publicly on the street. After that, the processions were basically uh, curtailed by the government. And at the same time, many of the elders who did these processions uh, started to die off. In 2015, El Museo de Regla organized a group of elders and reinvigorated La Procesión de Yemaya. I attended in 2019. And the procession takes this, the, a very similar process, a very similar strategic role through the town as did the, the, um, the original 1961 procession. With this, I want to emphasize that one of the, the importance of, of the processions and these public events is that they've also become opportunities for religious tourists, for academics, for musicians, um, for, for anyone who's studying social cultural aspects of religion in Cuba to participate in these, in these events. Uh, in 2019, there was about two dozen academics from all over the world at the Regla activity, um, participating and, and uh, examining how this was growing uh, from a small event in 2015 to a very large event in 2019. One of the things that has influenced the Orisha diaspora and has influenced the island of Cuba has been the internet. In the last few years, the large traditions, be them the Lukumi tradition, Candomblé, Yoruba land, uh, have seen strong interactions because of the internet. 
there's a greater ability to communicate and have, have also to establish uh, new communities. Many of the largest religious homes in Cuba now have godchildren, people that they work with religiously or have initiated, in other communities, uh, specifically in Mexico, Venezuela, the United States, Spain, so that the internet has fortified a transnational community in some ways. In, in my terminology, has fortified the Orisha diaspora, which has expanded and grown. This has also led to what I, what I call a global Orisha marketplace, because as more of these traditions interact and interact with Cuba, there's an opportunity to buy, sell, trade information, icons, par paraphernalia. It is not out of the ordinary to be in the Barrio Simpson, in the Arturos of Matanzas, or to be in Pogoloti and see numerous practitioners from other countries there being initiated, receiving icons. Um, this was part of my uh, question to Professor Campbell about the underground economy or the informal economy, because what I have seen is that the Orisha tradition has generated an informal economy where many Orisha priests across the island are living, are, are, are supplementing their income by the participation of, of turistas, or as some of the people on the island call, call them, lahumas, lohumas, who come to the island to participate in religious activities. <clears throat> However, the beauty of the global presence is that you, that you see this growing image everywhere. All of these three images in front of you, the, the one to the far left, is the Fiesta to Yemaya that is done every, every year in Salvador, Bahia. Yemaya has taken on a greater position in Bahia like in Cuba. She's associated with the ocean. The picture in the middle is actually the Tamboros del Loco in, that reside in Salamanca in Ciudad Matanza. They also celebrate the 7th of September with an annual festival. The, the picture you're seeing there is from the 2019 event where they make offerings and take it to the ocean. The last picture is actually from the United States and it was the annual festival for Oshun and Yemaya in San Antonio, Texas, where they go to the river and offer offerings to, to Yemaya. One of the, the reasons I chose Yemaya as the mother of the waters and the focus of the Orisha diaspora is because Yemaya is the patron saint of the Ogun River. I say patron saint, like I could say patroness, like I could say, I could say guiding spirit of the Ogun River in Nigeria. And in the New World, both Cuba and Brazil and in Trinidad, she took on a much greater influence. She was given ownership of the oceans. Um, there is a Lukumi myth that says she was given ownership of the ocean because she was the one who protected her children as they crossed the waters and came to Cuba, to Brazil, uh, through the slave trade. It, she also is a deity that is venerated across all of the diaspora and signifies the, the great mother of this tradition. So as the Orisha diaspora continues to grow and expand, Yemaya serves as kind of like a royal image to the growing community of, of Orisha worshipers. This is my last slide, and then I have a few additional comments. And one of the things that, that I noted as I started this research on the expansion of the Lukumi tradition in and out of the island was the use of certain images over and over and over again, no matter where the community was. So I selected this image, which is the image of Yemaya as a mermaid. Um, the far left picture is from the Yemaya shrine in Ilaro, which is a small town in the Ecuador region outside of Abelhuta. The middle image is actually the Yemaya shrine in Salvador Bahia. 
And uh, the next image is the sacred vessels of a Yemaya priestess in Miami uh, covered with mermaids. And finally, the last picture is the tools associated with Yemaya in the Lukumi tradition that you can see also has a mermaid. Um, sometimes words uh, can be confusing, but here you see the image over and over and over again, signifying that be it in Africa, be it in Brazil, be it in, in, in Cuba, this idea of Yemaya being a mermaid, Yemaya being a mother, Yemaya being associated with the waters is, is, is important. And she serves as a, a growth image because she is one of the Orishas that ties together the Orisha diaspora, may, uh, creates a unified image of the Dori Orisha diaspora. And as the diaspora continues to grow, as it continues to expand, Today, there are Lukumi practitioners in at least a dozen or more countries uh, outside of the United States, Canada, Mexico, Venezuela, Brazil, uh, Panama, Spain. There's actually practitioners in London. There are practitioners in the Netherlands. Um, these communities are starting to grow together. And they're also continuing, again, I want to reemphasize, to expand and include many practitioners that are no longer Afro-Cuban or Afro-Brazilian. And um, that's one of the reasons why I, I use the word or the expression Orisha diaspora, because in fact, the diaspora, the dispersal has really occurred with the Orishas and they're all over the globe. Um, Cuba, Cuba being one of the homes that these practitioners turn to and visit for what I call religious reju rejuvenation, which is coming back to, to the roots of the tradition and trying to interact with the people on the island. Thank you very much. Tony, I give it back to you. Oh, hang on, yep, I'm back now, thank you. And I actually did manage to see the slides just by going out and coming back in again. So I'm glad of that because they were magnificent slides. Thank you very much. And thank you for keeping well to time, in which case I think we've got up to 15 minutes of questions for anybody who's got any questions or comments or anything else. So away you go to Jeff. So any, any questions or anything, any input? It possibly helps, by the way, Jeff, if you would now remove, take down your... Um, uh, PowerPoint your slides and then we, that way we can see more clearly who's listening and who's who wants to come in. Thank you Right, uh, I'm looking to see if anybody wants to come in there and if they don't I will start the ball rolling All right, I'm afraid it's me Jeff, right the quite my question is that I remember being in a, um, a Small conference in Havana Which was attended and addressed in the middle of it was in the uh, what then the Centro de Antropología, but it's now an instituto. Mm -hmm. and the person who was talking about it was a specialist in Yoruba from Britain, a Yoruba specialist in African studies. And his view of the thing was because he had discovered talking to um, Orisha worshippers in, in Nigeria that when they went to Cuba, they were astonished to find how well preserved the rites and the ceremonies and so on were in Cuba, whereas they changed in Nigeria. Now, I wonder, did, have you found that as well? And what about the three or four or several different sites of the diaspora? Is there a difference developing in the way in which they um, celebrate, the way in which the rites um, are preserved or alternatively adapted? Tony, thank you. So one of the one of the things that that I think we should consider when we talk about Nigeria and let me just a, cu a couple of comments up front is keep in mind that the, the West Africans, when they were taken away during the slave trade during that 19th century period, there was no Yoruba. Yoruba was a name specifically associated with the Oyo people uh, given to them by the Hausa. So our descendants in Cuba, like in Brazil, didn't associate themselves with a unified community. They kind of saw themselves as Oyo, Egbado, Ilesha, right? So 
each of these communities brought different things to Cuba. What is, I, I do agree in is that no matter where you go, there are some fundamental aspects of Orisha worship that are identical. Th be them the songs that are used, the natural implements of nature, be them herbs or something else that are used, the way icons are created. If you go to Brazil, you'll see the similarity. You go to Cuba, you see the similarity. I've been to Nigeria four times, I see the similarity. That, I think, anyone who comes from Yoruba land to Cuba will see that and say, oh, yeah, I can see this. This is part of, of the tradition that came from where we're at. Where the variance comes in is one in the adaptive process, correct? The, the, the West Africans adapted a bit differently in Cuba than they did in Brazil. They've adapted in Nigeria. And Nigeria has had an influence of, of Christianity and, and more recently, the Pentecostal type movements in, in Nigeria. Before that, there was the influence of, of the Christian Missionary Society coming out of the UK. So there has been changes also in, in Nigeria. One of the things that's, that's interesting is, that I found interesting at least, was that when I went to, went to Nigeria, I found people practicing Orisha that, that were also Christians, practicing Orisha that were also Muslims, which was very common to what happens in Cuba and Brazil. So it wasn't like as if um, this is only a phenomenon on this side of the waters. It's a phenomenon on both sides of the waters. Um, one of the things that Orisha has is its ability to adapt. Um, given that, give, especially in the Lukumi system, you know, there's a common joke among Lukumi practitioners that the Lukumi system is kind of like a, a portable tradition. They pick up their stuff and they go wherever they need to go and they create a new a new location. Um, a bit different in Brazil because they have terreiros or religious homes. A bit different in Nigeria because most of the, the shrines are located and associated with a particular ground, a particular place. So a place is sacred. Uh, all of that had to be recreated in the diaspora differently. Thank you for that, Jeff. Uh, any other contributions? Any other questions? Since we have a few more minutes, I'd also like to make one more comment, Tony, since, Wait, since we got a couple. Yeah, I, I like to fill up my spot. Um, so, so I also think that with yesterday's conversations, um, about Cuban identity. I'm a little bit off topic here, but I wanted to, to put a Lukumi spin on this. Um, the, the Lukumi practitioners on the, on the island are a group that, that has probably, and I have no, no data to prove this, but they're a community that have a significant amount of relationships with communities outside of the island. Um, they, they interact with practitioners all over the globe who come back to Cuba. So that group probably has a greater awareness of differences between what goes on or what their lifestyle is in Cuba versus what their lifestyle, lifestyle of other practitioners are around the globe. So I think that that is something that this particular group contributes to the conversations on the island. They have a, a different relationship than other people do. Thanks for that, Jeff. That's really useful. Um, uh, was that what you wanted to say yesterday, by the way, when you <laughs> were frozen out of time? <laughs> I, I, yesterday, no, you, you know what? I thought yesterday's conversation was fabulous. I was just trying to emphasize, emphasize that that this, this issue is very, very complicated, as we've all said, and everyone has a piece of the puzzle here. And my piece of the puzzle is down in the ground, right? All of the people I interact with are people who live in Solares. Most of them are Afro-Cuban. Um, many of them are, uh, if, if you would say, uh, multi-generational poverty is, is, is what they've experienced. So it's, it's, you don't have a lot of these intellectual conversations, Tony, with those people on the ground. Sure. The, those people are, are worried about other things um, about Cuba. So yeah, it just depends on the lens you're using. Sure. Thank you. Um, I do have one other person wants to come in. Power, over to you. Yes, thank you very much, Jeff. I do want to come in just to actually pick up on what you yourself used. You used the metaphor of the puzzle, and that is the theme. I guess it is the theme that is emerging um, from this conference. It emerges pretty much from every Cuba Research Forum conference. 
but the idea that um and it, and it even came out in the round table that we had last night uh, tony can you just switch off your i don't know maybe it's me anyway it sounds like i'm in a washing machine never mind um so the idea that to understand any one of these things is a very very complex process and to explain the complexity historical and geographical uh, complexity is really the challenge of your thesis isn't it so you're telling a story of when we might think of Lukomi or we might think of the figure of Yemaya as being this fixed concept or a fixed image or a fixed representation or a fixed meaning actually it's moving all the time um, and it takes us right back to the very first paper from the conference which was Anne's paper about some kind of uh, much more complex idea of uh identity of meaning of belonging and all of those things so i just wanted to draw that out there's no question for you in it i just wanted to draw out that that concept that seems to be underlining everything that we're talking about in this conference and thanks for your paper jeff it's been my pleasure thank you all so much for listening okay uh i can't see anybody else wanting to come in and i have given too much opportunity suddenly we'll get 14 questions so i'm going to stop you there in which case, many thanks again, Jeff. That really was uh, not only interesting, but fun to, to be part of as well. So thank you very much for that. And I'm now going to pass over actually to Power as the technical expert so that she can get the uh, first of the audio recordings set up. And just in case you don't have the program in front of you, it's Vivian M. Sabater Palenzuela and Julio Germán Barrero Pérez of the University of Havana, title of their paper is Las Constituciones Cubanas Ante el Fenómeno Religioso, Continuidades y Discontinuidades Ante la Realidad de la Cuba de Hoy. And as far as we know, it's 20 minutes, so you should yes. be okay. So in the chat, again, once again, you have the Word document if you want to follow it. I'm pretty sure that in this case, um, Vivian and Julio, or Vivian is actually speaking it, has followed very closely the... Um, paper that you have in a written form in the chat. Okay, so feel free to open that in your browser and I'm gonna start the audio. Could somebody just confirm as we start that you can hear it? Las constituciones cubanas ante no el problem. Great. fenómeno religioso, continuidades y rupturas ante la realidad de la Cuba de hoy. Autores, Julio Germán Barreiro Pérez y Vivian Margarita Sabate Palenzuela, La Habana, Cuba, septiembre del 2021. El cuadro religioso cubano se ha caracterizado por una amplia diversidad de formas y organizaciones religiosas, resultado del establecimiento de distintos modelos socioculturales que han arribado durante siglos a nuestro archipiélago, aunque actualmente se han verificado el incremento de nuevas formas de manifestaciones religiosas, acunadas bajo la amplia y cuasi infinita denominación de nuevos movimientos religiosos, aún prevalece en Cuba una religiosidad espontánea, asistemática, referida fundamentalmente a elementos de las devociones cristianas y de religiosas de cultura Afri de origen africano. De velar aspectos significativos que han caracterizado la presentación o misión en las constituciones cubanas de la problemática religiosa, significando entre ellas las posibles continuidades y estructuras, fomenta en la Cuba de hoy un interesante debate que rebasa los límites académicos. A inicios del siglo XIX regía en el territorio español y en sus colonias la constitución política de la monarquía española de 1812, primera en la historia hispana que, pese a algunas propuestas liberales, mostró un arraigado conservadurismo respecto a la temática religiosa. Por ejemplo, al rey había que darle un tratamiento de majestad católica, la religión para la nación, para la nación española y sus colonias, valorada como única y verdadera, era la religión católica, apostólica y romana, y por tanto era la única que podía practicar legalmente su culto. En Cuba, durante este periodo, se fue gestando un anhelo de nacionalidad, tuvo su génesis en ideas autonomistas, que ansiaba la existencia de un derecho constitucional que le representase en una sociedad fraccionada en elementos y clases sociales, en grupos étnicos y raciales arraigadas a la esclavitud, y ante una oligarquía azucarera criolla, parcialmente influenciada por las ideas de 
ilustración en medio de diversas tendencias políticas. El primer proyecto constitucional titulado Proyecto de Constitución para la Isla de Cuba fue redactado por José Joaquín Infante ante la derrota de la primera conspiración de tipo separatista en Cuba. En él hallamos algunas novedades respecto al tema que nos compete. Por ejemplo, en el artículo 35, a pesar de declarar a la religión católica como dominante, novedosamente dispuso que se tolerarían otras manifestaciones de culto. De manera aún más palpable, la historia del constitucionalismo cubano se evidencia en la práctica social a partir de 1868 con la redacción y aprobación de las llamadas constituciones de Cuba en armas. La primera fue la constitución de Weimar, que rigió entre 1869 y 1878 en los territorios liberados por los mambises. Ella representó un encomiable esfuerzo en pro de la unidad nacional y asumió en el orden político la idea de los derechos naturales del hombre, dedicando varios artículos para regular. Por ejemplo, en el artículo 28 expresó que la Cámara no podía atacar las libertades de culto, imprenta, reunió reunión pacífica, enseñanza, se omitieron cualquier referencia a la Iglesia Católica y su expresión en el artículo 24, todos los habitantes de la República son enteramente libres, estableció la primacía de la libertad, así independencia y abolición pasaron a ser condiciones sinónimas. Posteriormente, ante la necesidad de crear un mando único de carácter político-militar que dirigiera las acciones de las fuerzas orientales que seguían en rebeldía no aceptar el pacto de San Juan se decidió promulgar la constitución de Baraguá de 1878 posteriormente se redactó la constitución de Jimaguayú de 1895 en estas dos últimas constituciones se omite cualquier referencia al tema de interés que nos convoca la constitución de la Yaya de 1897 última constitución mambice estipuló derechos individuales y políticos y un título para la, cantar, la carta más Constitución de la República de Cuba. En el artículo 6 enunció que cubanos y extranjeros serían amparados en sus opiniones religiosas y en el ejercicio de sus respectivos cultos, mientras que esto no se opusiesen a la moral pública. La etapa republicana incluye el momento inicial de intervención norteamericana entre 1898 y 1902. Estados Unidos para entonces intentó conservar cierta legitimidad especial para la Iglesia Católica, pero ante todo favoreció el establecimiento de las iglesias protestantes bajo el control de sus justas misioneras y el desalojo de misioneros cubanos vinculados a las primeras iglesias que habían estado en Cuba desde 1883 y naturalmente porque ellos habían participado en su gran mayoría en el movimiento independentista. En 1901 se redactó y aprobó una nueva constitución de la República que invocaba a Dios del preámbulo y en su artículo 26 afirmaba que era libre de profesión todas las religiones y el ejercer sus cultos sin otra limitación que el respeto a la moral cristiana y al orden público, aseverando que la Iglesia estaría separada, separada del Estado. En realidad, haber ubicado a la moral cristiana como parámetro es un elemento novedoso para el desarrollo de las constituciones cubanas en aquel momento. El 5 de julio de 1940 fue promulgada la nueva constitución heredera de la historia y el derecho constitucional cubano aquí vamos a ver en el artículo 10 inciso A, destacó entre los derechos ciudadanos de residir en su patria sin ser objeto de discriminación o extorsión alguna entre ellas, ni entre los objetos de discriminación no debían de ser las creencias religiosas en el artículo 20 también establece que los cubanos todas eran iguales ante la ley. En el artículo 35 repite lo establecido en el 1901 de que se dispone la libre profesión de todas las religiones con la limitación de, la moral, de no afectar la moral cristiana y el orden público y que la iglesia sería separada del Estado. Ya en el año 58, tras la derrota política y militar del régimen batistiano, se inauguró un gobierno provisional revolucionario que enfrentaba entre sus desafíos lograr la unidad política de todas las fuerzas insurreccionales comprometidas con los objetivos históricos del nacionalismo radical cubano y naturalmente había una oposición interna y una externa especialmente la externa liderada por Estados Unidos. La lucha política se evidenció también en el seno de las iglesias había fracciones entre la jerarquía y la membresía tanto en la iglesia católica como en los grupos confesionales evangélicos. En 1959 se redactó la ley fundamental de la República, primera medida revolucionaria que amparó el proceso de refundación. El nuevo documento legislativo descansaba básicamente la Constitución de 1940 y por eso se repite el contenido y la numeración en los artículos 10, inciso A, 20, 35 y finalmente en el 55. Para entonces, en Cuba se iniciaba la búsqueda de un modelo que partiendo de las condiciones históricas y culturales de la nación permitiera superar el capitalismo dependiente cubano.
y proclamar un socialismo nacional, algo que sería proclamado en sentido general en abril de 1961. En 1965 se dio a conocer la decisión de cambiar el nombre del Partido Único de la Revolución Socialista por el Partido Comunista de Cuba, era una es organización partidaria constituida por la cooptación selectiva de sus miembros, que lamentablemente en sus estatutos desde el inicio puso como obligación de sus militantes luchar contra el oscurantismo religioso, lo que significó no solo el rechazo a que enteraran sus filas partidistas creyentes relacionados con las actividades contrarrevolucionarias, sino en general todo creyente. Al valorar que las concesiones religiosas impedían la comprensión científica de la realidad, se pedía que los aspirantes a entrar en el partido, dejaran atrás las creencias religiosas y se adhirieran al marxismo-leninismo. En 1974, el legislarse la elección, constitución y el funcionamiento de los órganos del del denominado ensayo del poder popular que se hizo en la provincia de Matanzas se hizo necesaria una nueva reforma constitucional y legislativa y por eso es que nosotros vamos a encontrar que hay todo un proceso, un anteproyecto de constitución aprobado en el año 75 por referendo popular 97.7 de los votos emitidos y una constitución aprobada en 1966. En ella se declaraba la afiliación del texto a la doctrina marxista-leninista y se anunciaba al Partido Comunista de Cuba como la vanguardia marxista-leninista, fuerza dirigente y superior de la sociedad. En el artículo 41 se hablaba de la no discriminación por motivo de raza, color, sexo u otra cosa que infringiera la dignidad humana. En el artículo 43 se habla de los derechos iguales de la mujer y el hombre. En el 54, que es lo que más nos compete porque es el tema de religión, se dice que el Estado educaba al pueblo en la concepción científica materialista, pero reconoce y garantiza la libertad de conciencia, el derecho de cada uno a profesar cualquier creencia religiosa y a practicar dentro de respeto a la ley y el culto de su preferencia. Es decir, que la ley también regulaba actividades de las instituciones religiosas y declaraba como ilegal e indigno, y esto es lo nuevo de este momento, oponer la fe o la creencia religiosa a la revolución, a la educación, al cumplimiento de los deberes de trabajar, defender la patria con las armas, reverencia a sus símbolos y los demás deberes establecidos. Durante el primer congreso del Partido Comunista de Cuba en el año 75, se redactó un documento titulado sobre la política en relación con la religión, la iglesia y los creyentes, que ante todo declaraba reconocer la libertad de conciencia, la laicidad del Estado, el derecho ciudadano de profesar o no creencias religiosas, pero que a su vez expresaba que la religión era un reflejo tergiversado de la realidad y por ello a referirse de su papel social siempre era conservador. Olvidando, evidentemente, toda la historia de mártires y héroes que tenemos, no solamente en Cuba, sino en latinoamericanos y mundiales, con unas actitudes revolucionarias desde su cosmovisión religiosa y la existencia de modos teológicos nítidamente liberadores. Por ello puede afirmarse que en este texto se encuentran afirmaciones y valoraciones que están contrapuestas. En los estatutos del Partido Comunista de Cuba, en su artículo 15 sobre los deberes del militante, en el Epira Fede se convocaba, entre otros aspectos, a luchar contra las supersticiones religiosas y otras reminiscencias ideológicas negativas del pasado. Y también en los estatutos de la Unión de Jóvenes Comunistas de aquel momento, en su capítulo 2, artículo 10, Epígrafe, también se incitaba a oponer las verdades científicas a las supersticiones de todo tipo, reminiscencias ideológicas del pasado, entre las cuales se consideraban que estaban las creencias religiosas. Preferentemente se comprendía la religión como, ven, como una forma de la conciencia social caracterizada por una visión totalmente errónea y tergiversada de la realidad. Y nosotros vamos a ver que en el Segundo Congreso del Partido Comunista de Cuba de 1980, referido al tema de interés, pueden encontrarse no solo la aceptación de los tripulados del primer Congreso del Partido del año 75, sino que además ratificó explícitamente la unidad entre cristianos revolucionarios y marxistas, sin llegar a promover lo que debía haber promovido con mayor amplitud, que era la unidad entre revolucionarios en sentido general, sean cristianos o no y sean marxistas o no, a favor de la lucha de los cambios sociales. Posteriormente se celebró el tercer Congreso del Partido en el 85 y fue en el cuarto Congreso del Partido 1991 en que se decidió que el ingreso al partido dependía de la ejemplaridad y no de la tenencia o no de creencia religiosa. Es decir, que no tenía que ser esto es un elemento sobre el cual se educar o se preguntar al individuo. En este año en Cuba se legalizó por primera vez una organización representante de las religiones de origen africano, la Asociación Cultural Yoruba de Cuba. Para entonces ya se había realizado en Cuba el Encuentro Nacional Eclesial Cubano que proyectó nuevos modos de relación entre la institución católica y el Estado. Había desaparecido el bloque soviético del campo socialista con quien Cuba sostenía el 85% de su comercio exterior y reconocido el bloqueo norteamericano. Cuba ha comenzado a vivir una severa crisis económica que se ha dado a llamar periodo especial, con repercusiones en otros campos de la vida social, incluyendo el religioso. Así llegamos al año 1992, 
donde existe una reforma de la Constitución, hemos hablado de las anteriores porque no competen a este tema, pero esta reforma sí fue muy interesante, esta reforma que tuvo la Constitución de 1975. La reforma de 1992, en medio de complejas situaciones, primeramente define al Estado, ya no solamente como un Estado de obreros y campesinos, sino también agrega de trabajadores manuales e intelectuales. El Partido Comunista de Cuba se define entonces como martiano y marxista leninista y se habla además de que el Estado reconoce, respeta y garantiza la libertad religiosa y que las diferentes religiones gozan de igualdad ante el Estado, pero hace un artículo 55 que es lo novedoso que dice que el Estado que reconoce, respeta y garantiza la libertad de conciencia y de religión reconoce, respeta y garantiza a la vez la libertad de cada ciudadano de cambiar de creencia religiosa o no tener ninguna y a profesar dentro del respeto a la ley y al culto religioso de su preferencia. Finalmente en Cuba, origen la Constitución del 2019, portadora de un extenso preámbulo de matiz histórico e ideológico. El proyecto redactado por una comisión del Parlamento fue sometido a consulta popular, donde participaron más de 8 millones de personas que estimularon aproximadamente la reforma del 60% del contenido original. Ahí se ratifican una serie de elementos que ya conocíamos anteriores, con respecto a la libertad religiosa, con respecto a la laicidad del Estado, con respecto a respetar los derechos y deberes de todas las creencias y religiones que gozan de igual consideración y de la enseñanza laica. Destaca también, retoma el artículo 55 de 1992, donde toda persona tiene derecho a profesar o no creencias religiosas. Nosotros podemos destacar cuatro elementos importantes. Finalmente podemos destacar que las constituciones de la Cuba en armas destacan por su provisionalidad y aunque de acuerdo a la teoría constitucional una carta magna es un texto pensado para perdurar, en todas ellas su duración dependía de la subsistencia de la guerra. Eran textos de emergencia. En ninguna de las cuatro constituciones en armas ni en las posteriores del periodo republicano y menos aún revolucionario se hace referencia a la Iglesia Católica como religión dominante y en el caso de las cuatro constituciones en Cuba ni siquiera se cita especialmente las manifestaciones religiosas cristianas. Ante todo, conscientemente se deseó alejarse de una institución religiosa que obstaculizaba el proceso de independencia cubano, ya que la mayoría del clero y la jerarquía católica de origen español se situaron al lado de los intereses de la corona española. En el periodo republicano, el constitucionalismo cubano, que nació estrechamente vinculado a las raíces del liberalismo patrio, manifestó continuidades y estructuras con respecto a la etapa precedente. Respecto al tema de interés, se privilegia como medida y canon de conducta la religión cristiana, algo que es más inclusivo y que evidentemente reconoce la presencia de cristianos protestantes ya presentes en el país. No obstante, resulta exclusiva porque solo para cristianos, en tanto otras manifestaciones religiosas quedaban reducidas a simples cultos subordinados eh, a estos que estaban destacándose con una visión cristianocéntrica. Para algunos estudiosos, la década de 70 representó una inflexión para la revolución cubana. La nueva constitución, pese a que fue el primer texto constitucional cubano que hizo alusión directa a José Martí y a su ideario, delineó esta situación y en la práctica el marco de doctrina fue más rígido. Se entronizaba, pese a todas las declaraciones oficiales en la práctica cotidiana, el ateísmo sin llegar a mostrar lo que se conceptúa por un Estado ateo, ya que se admitía la diversidad de formas de existencia de las creencias religiosas, instituciones y modos de culto y no se atentó contra la estructura material de las instituciones. La Constitución de 2019 sabemos que es un texto perfectible, como toda obra humana, porta un salto cualitativo respecto a la Constitución del 76, no solo por los cambios en la esfera económica y la concesión propia de la ciudadanía, sino que además a través de sus principios fundamentales reitera una vez más, con más eh, ahínco que otras ocasiones, el concepto de equidad, entre otros, algo que novedosamente se reitera en el artículo 3, en el artículo 30, muy... Eh, muy explícito respecto a la igualdad en el artículo 42. Aquí evidentemente se enriquece la propuesta de no discriminación y se alerta que la ley castigará a quien viole tan importante aspecto de la Constitución. El artículo 55 repite que toda persona tiene derecho en Cuba a profesar o no creencias religiosas, a cambiar y a practicar la religión de su preferencia. No es solo lo que se expresa en ella, es la situación nacional que favorece sin idealizaciones ni ajena de contradicciones en medio de complejidades sociales, una interrelación más estrecha entre lo establecido en la Constitución y las leyes que emanan y emanarán de las necesidades de salvaguardar lo establecido constitucionalmente. La Cuba de hoy persiste en fisura en la equidad social, en la combinación de principios de igualdad con el de diversidad respecto al tema religioso. Aún se detectan apreciaciones equívocas y excluyentes que muestran su valoración de las religiones de origen africano u otras sobre dimensión de la espiritualidad religiosa por sobre la espiritualidad no religiosa y o viceversa, intolerancias recreadas entre los llamados viejos y nuevos grupos religiosos 
y entre personas no religiosas respecto a los religiosos o viceversa. La equidad y el respeto a la diferencia son un proceso que debe construirse paso a paso, que debe visibilizar y desmontar cualquier reducto protector de cualquier modo de discriminación. Para lograrlo, fundamental será la constitución, el conocimiento que de ella tenga su, el pueblo y la creación y efectividad del cuerpo de leyes garante de su aplicación, concibiendo que cada constitución necesitará ser reescrita y reevaluada a lo largo de la historia. Muchas gracias. Okay, well, that was um, a lot to take in. You have got the written, tienen el documento escrito ahí. There's a lot to take in, but you've got the, uh, yeah, there's a round of applause. I think there is because um, Dr. Sabater Valenzuela and Dr. Germán Barreiro Pérez um, were able to condense an awful lot of information into that paper. Um, so please, um, I'm personally going to find it very useful in understanding the constitutional shape of Uh, approaches to religion and um, the role of religion in, in Cuban society before and after 1959. Um, just by way of a break, if that's okay, Tony, I know that you're supposed to be chairing it. I'm just wondering if, as um, that paper was being played to you, uh, I was just, I wondered if Jeff is there and if there was a question that I could just ask him. Jeff, there you are. I'm here. Great, and I, it will also feel a little bit like we've responded to these papers because um, they have worked contra viento y marea to get them to me. So I'd like there to be a little bit of a discussion afterwards as well. So I think fitting in really with um, some of the themes that have come up today, I'm wondering about the whole pre-59 period and a kind of a lack of definition about the role of religion but also the role of african religions in the revolutionary in the insurrectionary process in the in the run-up to revolution because um at the beginning of the paper they referred to the constitution and the emerging sense of nation building in the late late 1800s early 1900s obviously with independence etc etc and uh My question for you really is that we, we, you know, we know a lot about uh, legislative, but probably more social and cultural ways of prescribing religious practice in Cuba since 59. But what evidence is there that uh, practicing Afro-Cuban religions and being part of the revolutionary cause before 59 were part and parcel of the same thing? In other words, because it was a process of identity building and national unification, what role and what place did Afro-Cuban religions have in that run up to 1959? I'm not sure if I'm making myself very clear. <clears throat> yes, and okay, so it, this is not my greatest strength, but but I, I can say uh, several things here on this topic. First, up through the, the time of independence, We have Jose, Jose Mati talking about a Cuba for, for todo el mundo, right? Everyone is involved in la, the idea of Cubanidad. That, that definitely included the Afro-Cuban community through what would be considered, I think, the, the, the wars of independence and creating a free Cuba, if I can use that term within parentheses at that time. Um, however, Afro-Cuban traditions also have had a love-hate relationship with whatever organized government there has been in Cuba since the colonial period, right. um, as, as an example. In 1903 was the scare of La Niña Zol, Zoila, which was believed that unos brujos uh, killed the little girl and sacrificed her. There was at that time a tremendous movement against African religions. When the Republic was established, even Fernando Diz, who was uh, a follower of Lombroso, uh, thought that, that you could, the African identity could shed its backwards religious imagery and beliefs and become integrated into the national identity of Cuba. Uh, Professor Brofman has a very good book on this called Measures of Equality. Um, running up to 1959, I think the Afro-Cuban community as a whole was very supportive of change so that they found themselves supporting the Cuban revolution um, 
in, in many different ways. However, once the Cuban Revolution arrived, then there was this idea about uh, the Marxist theory that right yeah. religion is the opiate of the people. So there was a bit of oppression that has occurred. Yeah, uh, I think it's, it's, it's the run up to 59 that we don't often talk about because, you know, we know some of the sort of anecdotal stories of the of the doves <clears throat> on the shoulders, et cetera, et cetera. But in that sense of uh, kind of a group bottom up grassroots nation building, what part different religious beliefs and traditions played in that in making Cubans feel that they were included um, in the idea of the Cuban nation? You, uh, you, go on. So, so I think I think that I think that again that the original the original idea uh, at the arrival of the republic is that there is this nation building we're all together right but as the as as time goes on there is also a rejection of aspects of Afro Cuban culture and. So again, there's a kind of love-hate relationship. I mean, also if we consider the destruction of a Partido Independiente de Color, right? Which, which was also a way that Afro-Cubans mm -hmm. felt like they had a voice and that was, was eliminated. Yeah. Um, continues to have um, kind of a love-hate relationship. I also think part that it's important that from the colonial period this way, all Afro-Cuban religious traditions have always had a veneer of secrecy so that it, it it at times the public expression was that of going to church or being a good catholic which would have been typical correct while not overemphasizing the the african aspect of it mm -hmm. however with that being said el cabildo de de papa silvestre is documented as having sent several letters to the Republican government uh, through the beginning of the 20th century, um, highlighting the contribution of Afro-Cubans to the independence movement and their inclusion in Cuban society. So there has always been participation. Hmm. Now, the, the, the hard part is to decide how much of that was religious religiously driven yeah right um, yep no, no no it's a, it's an interesting question it's a question that because it's a it's a question of race as well it's a question that is is definitely topical for today so i will let you rest now i didn't mean to jump that on you but thank you okay. very much um tony do you want to go back to chairing and i will find the next documents okay then right um well while you're uh, finding that next document and setting it up again. It's another 20 minutes. It is um, Maximiliano Francisco Trujillo Lemes from the University of Havana, who actually has long been a member of the forum and attended conferences and given papers when we've held them in Havana and also come over to Britain for a, um, a, a research visit as well. So we know him well. Unfortunately, uh, like all the Cubans, he's unable mostly to be available now, so he has sent us the recording. And he has worked on religion for some time, mostly on um, Catholicism and Protestantism, but nonetheless, religion generally. And the title of his paper is with question marks, Fundamenta, Fundamentalismo, sorry, Fundamentalismo Religioso en Cuba, question. So are you ready now, Pa? Yes, I am ready. What I'm going to try and do, but it may not work, he has a very short introduction and then there are two audios. So you'll just have to be a little bit patient, but I'm going to try the video introduction so you can actually see his face. Let's see if that works. With audio. All right, I'm going to try that again because I probably forgot to yep, share system audio. There we go. Right, if again somebody could let me know if it works. Can you see him? Yes. Right, next question, can you hear him? Here we go. Si hay un fenómeno que hoy afecta. Yes. Yeah. Si sí, se escucha, por. Se escucha. Yes, yes. Gracias. Las relaciones morales, las construcciones éticas e incluso las estructuraciones de orden 
político en América Latina y por qué no también en Estados Unidos es la problemática del fundamentalismo religioso. Esto es un fenómeno que también, claro, está afectando a la realidad cubana. El trabajo que les presento a continuación tiene como título Fundamentalismo religioso en Cuba y procura dilucidar desde ciertas experiencias investigadas en los últimos tiempos cómo se ha manifestado esto. Ok, ahora vamos a pasar a los audios, ¿ya? Bueno, tiene el documento y vamos a pasar a los audios. Bueno, comienzo con la lectura del texto. Ok. Puede darles esta introducción. Desde hace varios años existen evidencias de que en ciertos sectores de las iglesias evangélicas radicadas en Cuba se denotan manifestaciones de fundamentalismo religioso, sobre todo en aquellas cuyos gérmenes proceden de iglesias homólogas nacidas en Estados Unidos o Brasil y que tras la explosión neoliberal de los 90 en América han producido y se ascriben a la llamada teología de la prosperidad, muy común en los definidos por los especialistas como nuevos movimientos religiosos, que en su vertiente más numerosa se ascriben al llamado neopentecostalismo. Estos movimientos son de más corta data en este país. Nacieron en lo fundamental en las décadas de los 90 y los 2000, durante los años más duros de la crisis económica que sacudió a la isla tras el desplome del bloque socialista, o en las décadas posteriores, tras no resolverse eficientemente el deslave de los 90. Es pertinente reconocer que estas actitudes de parte del campo religioso nacional aún no muestran explícitamente las, las pretensiones de sus homólogas continentales, que serían formar agrupaciones políticas con base ética en su propuesta teologal y acceder a las estructuras de gobierno o ser grupos de presión en relación a este. La alarma sonó quizás por primera vez con fuerza aquí entre agosto y septiembre del 2011 y tuvo lugar en derredor de la Iglesia Evangélica Pentecostal, fuente de vida de la denominación Asamblea de Dios, situada en el cruce de las calles de Santa Marta e Infanta, esta última una concurrida arteria de La Habana. De acuerdo con los hechos recopilados por diversas fuentes, a finales de agosto del 2011, Casi un centenar de fieles se encerraron en el citado templo con su líder, el ex reverendo Braulio, Braulio perdón, Herrera Tito. Según algunos cronistas, los antecedentes de este suceso son los siguientes. En 2010, Herrera Tito venía presentando problemas con la sede de su denominación. La causa del conflicto era la prédica y proclamación con carácter profético de una doctrina llamada la perfección la cual es contraria al corpus doctrinal de su iglesia. Cuando se le interrogaba al respecto, escribía el mismo documento de Antoñique Izquierdo, una figura muy controvertida, diríamos, de las religiones populares en Cuba de la década del 50 y el 70. Y decía que era un mandato divino y escuchaba la voz de Dios que le hablaba revelaba mensaje. Algunos de sus seguidores, tras la desautorización de la dirección de su congregación en relación a las poses de Herrera, quien al decir de sus superiores separó familia y violó principios bíblicos fundamentales, se hicieron voceros de una prédica apocalíptica en la cual se anunciaba una suerte de cataclismo inmediato sobre Cuba por sus pecados y pactos con el demonio. A pesar de que no habían puesto una fecha límite para el armagedón que estaba por venir, los seguidores de Braulio comenzaron a almacenar en el templo agua, provisiones y ropa y demás. ¿Por qué he escuchado hablar Braulio? Esto venidero en el que morirían millones de personas a lo largo de la isla, según solían afirmar. Luego te, tendría lugar una conversión masiva por parte de los sobrevivientes que no habían escuchado el mensaje de salvación de los labios del propio Braulio. Aquello sería el punto cero de una nueva era cristiana global, anunciaba su líder. Sin embargo, para clasificar estas iglesias o agrupaciones 
fundamentalistas o no en Cuba, primero, primero sería pertinente adentrarse en la génesis, conceptualización y caracterización de las prácticas religiosas presente en el ámbito de la política, de la filosofía, de la arte, o cualquiera que, o donde quiera que haya un cambio de espiritualidad que se considere insuperable, omnisciente o paradigmático. Varios autores consideran que el término fundamentalismo tiene su origen en una serie de panfletos publicados entre 1910 y 1915 en los Estados Unidos, previo y durante la Primera Guerra Mundial proceso bélico que aceleró la modernización de aquel país, su, su, su secularización y hegemonización dentro de Occidente, por el rol de habituallador que jugó en relación a los dos bloques en conflicto. Entiéndase la triple alianza y la intente. Con el título Los fundamentos, un testimonio de la verdad, los panfletos escritos por pastores protestantes en Estados Unidos se repartían gratuitamente entre las iglesias y los seminarios en contra de la pérdida de influencia de los principios evangélicos en América durante las primeras décadas del siglo XX. Era la declaración cristiana de la verdad literal de la Biblia. Estas personas se consideraban guardianas de la verdad. El fundamentalismo es entendido como una corriente religiosa o ideológica que promueve la interpretación literal de sus textos sagrados por encima de una interpretación contextual o por la aplicación intransigente y estricta de una doctrina o práctica establecida. Por lo que considera un determinado libro como autoridad máxima ante la cual ninguna autoridad puede invocarse y la que incluso debería imponerse sobre las leyes de las sociedades democráticas. Sin embargo, como prácticas es tan antiguo como los martirologios cristianos en la Roma imperial, las cruzadas medievales, la expulsión de los musulmanes y judíos de la España del siglo XV o la célebre matanza de San Bartolomé en agosto de 1572 y que no fue otra cosa que el asesinato en más de Hugo Notes en la Francia del siglo XIV, todos estos hechos fueron justificados por presuntas causales doctrinales o de fe o con múltiples hechos de crueldad y con múltiples hechos de crueldad extrema. Es perentorio recordar que desde entonces no han cesado sucesos de esta naturaleza en todas las regiones del planeta. Por tanto, cuando se habla de fundamentalismo, no se debe pensar únicamente en inofensivas actitudes teológicas de un grupo, iglesia o institución religiosa, casi únicamente vinculada a las llamadas religiones del libro, entiéndase el judaísmo, el cristianismo, el islamismo, sino a prácticas violentas explícitas en muchos casos. ¿Por qué el fundamentalismo religioso se da casi unánimamente en las religiones del libro? Según los entendidos, porque en otras religiones, entiéndase, por ejemplo, el budismo, el confucionismo, existen diversidad de leyendas, mitos, figuras divinas y legendarias, conceptos filosóficos que ofrecen una multiplicidad de interpretaciones. Toda esta multiplicidad no se cumple con rigor un criterio de la definición del fundamentalismo religioso y que está contenido en su propia conceptualización que no es otra cosa que el conjunto de postulados que afirma la inamovilidad de la tradición, una, infabili una infalibilidad literal de los textos sagrados. En segundo lugar, las religiones monoteístas se caracterizan por ser religiones de libro, es decir, que en ellas existe un texto considerado como sagrado, en donde se manifiesta una revelación hecha por Dios a los hombres, a través de un arcángel o de un profeta. Esto significa que se ha estructurado una interpretación de los respectivos textos, textos sagrados. Una de las fuentes más significativas del fundamentalismo religioso suele ser la figura del sacerdote, entendido como pastor, ayatolá, rabino, papa, a quien pertenece el derecho exclusivo de interpretar la palabra de Dios 
y cuyas interpretaciones se consideran como verdad absoluta o normas infalibles para el resto de la comunidad religiosa. El fundamentalismo en sus nuevas configuraciones tiene por lo menos dos grandes etapas. La primera se extendió por las décadas de los 60 y los 80 del siglo XX y otra es un producto básicamente del, del periodo posterior a la caída del socialismo real, del desbanque del marxismo-leninismo como ideología de Estado en las naciones de ese extinto bloque militar o político o como instrumento de fe y fuente de dogmatismo ideopolítico dentro de las estructuras de la izquierda de inspiración estalinista o, ma o maoísta en todas partes del mundo y se extiende hasta hoy. Durante estas etapas, el, funda el fundamentalismo ha adoptado por lo menos tres formas de manifestarse, como fundamentalismo estatal, extraestatal o semiestatal y comunitario. Los dos primeros fueron mucho más típicos de su primer periodo, mientras que el comunitario caracteriza el estatus actual de esa actitud y se configuró con más fuerza a partir de la década de los 90, aunque en muchos lugares hoy sigue manifestándose y avanzando en sus otras dos formas precedentes. El fundamentalismo en su primer momento quería, y cito, instaurar la ley religiosa como la única capaz de interpretar a toda la sociedad sobre la base de certezas y valores absolutos. Estos son fundamentalismos tradicionales que se caracterizan por su oposición manifiesta a la modernidad, una interpretación estricta de los textos religiosos, una proclama por rescatar las raíces históricas del Estado y la sociedad. Fin de la cita. A partir de los 90 y sobre todo en los 2000, han optado en lo fundamental por incidir en la llamada sociedad civil y en las normas de vida cotidiana de los grupos humanos donde están insertos de los que forman parte. Los fundamentalismos estatales suelen ser aquellos cuya forma de organización y función está centrada principalmente en el Estado y operan sustentados presuntamente en la religión. Siguen existiendo, por ejemplo, los casos de Irán y Arabia Saudita como los más paradigmáticos, pero no son los únicos. Mientras que los fundamentalismos extraestatales o semiestatales tienen una función mixta que combina su rol en el Estado con la que ejercen en el sistema político parlamentario. Son ilustrativos la existencia de senadores republicanos apoyados por la nueva derecha cristiana en el Congreso de los Estados Unidos o la presencia de parlamentarios con esa afiliación en países como Brasil, Costa Rica o Honduras, por citar tres en el contexto latinoamericano, y que cada vez muestran tener más influencia política y capacidad de presión al sistema, aunque están presentes en otros muchos países. Por su parte, los fundamentalismos comunitarios se corporizan fundamentalmente en forma de iglesias y movimientos evangélicos protestantes, que sería hasta ahora la expresión única de existencia en Cuba, por ser el ámbito cultural del que forma parte esta isla. Es preciso acotar que en América Latina los fundamentalismos religiosos se manifiestan en forma más indirecta y menos abierta que en otras partes del mundo. Y como norma, no vinculado a experiencias o movimientos internacionales, sino nacido de las propias dinámicas sociales y espirituales del subcontinente en lo que coinciden con el caso cubano. Y ahora vamos a pasar a la otra grabación. Un momento. Volviendo al principio, es preciso que aclarar que en Cuba no son frecuentes las alarmas por manifestaciones de fundamentalismo o fanatismo religioso. La propia idiosincrasia de nuestra religiosidad, que es tendencialmente a institucional, relativamente horizontal, y horizontal, perdón, y muy permeable a la transmigración de un credo o actitud de fe a otra entre los creyentes, así como la existencia de un ambiente en que y cito, cristianos como no cristianos conviven en clima social de respeto, 
flexibilidad y tolerancia. A esto sumamos el hecho de que en nuestra estructura social aún existe un, generaliza, un generalizado espíritu inclusivista en el cual puede apreciarse una constante permeabilidad en las relaciones sociales que en algunos casos llegan a la transgresión de los espacios personales, personales y privados. Esta conjugación de elementos ha hecho difícil la radicalización por parte de sectores sociales en el terreno socio-religioso. Visto así, el extremismo religioso en nuestro país es algo extraño a la naturaleza psicosocial de los cubanos. Pero no por ello se debe dejar de estar alerta ante la presencia de manifestaciones de este tipo que ahora vuelven a aparecer en la palestra pública con no menos agresividad visual y verbal ante la presunta inclusión, por ejemplo, de un artículo en el nuevo, en lo que fue en el 2017-18, del nuevo proyecto constitucional que pretendía modificar el concepto de matrimonio y que terminó por no aprobarse o de aprobarse de otra manera y que, claro, cambiaría las bases constitutivas de la definición de familia recono reconociendo la existencia de estructuras familiares que se alejan del canon tradicional monogámico y heteronormativo. Tal asunto provocó y sigue provocando que por lo menos cinco iglesias de diferentes denominaciones, y hoy son un poquito más, emitieran un, comunidad, un comunicado público oponiéndose con palabras duras a la inclusión del presunto artículo 68 de Marras en el proyecto constitucional y que vuelvo a insistir, terminó por no ser aprobado y pretendieran convocar hasta manifestaciones y marchas públicas para oponerse a la aprobación de ese artículo en el proyecto constitucional del 2017-18 que terminó por ser la constitución aprobada en febrero del 19, pero sin la presencia de ese artículo, generando enfrentamientos verbales entre las partes en conflicto que han trascendido en lo esencial a las redes sociales y en ciertos espacios públicos en que se han pegado propaganda a favor o en contra de lo que se aspira a legislar hechos no comunes en las prácticas cívicas cubanas de los últimos 62 años. Hicieron, por ejemplo, en varios espacios públicos, carteles donde se defendía la cultura tradicional, mamá, papá y la mamá, o lo contrario, la defensa de otro tipo de familia por parte de los que se oponían a estas iglesias. En los días sucesivos se han denominado en varios espacios públicos de La Habana, sobre todo en el año 2018 y parte del 19, la reunión de cantidades significativas de creyentes de estas iglesias o denominaciones que convocaban a transeúntes a escuchar sus prédicas y argumentos y que presuntamente implicaban una lectura literal, literal de la Biblia donde se explicaba la naturaleza sagrada del matrimonio y la familia tradicional nada en común a las construcciones éticas de una parte importante de las iglesias cristianas incluso de algunas con posturas más liberales tratados teológicos hermenéuticos de los textos sagrados. Por ello hay que delimitar con estudios de casos mucho más responsables si se tratan o no de actitudes fundamentalistas todas aquellas que impugnan el llamado matrimonio igualitario o la ideología de género cuando estamos ante un asunto tan sensible para estas comunidades en el orden de la aprehensión de lo moral como son los casos que ocupan a la actual polémica que ahora además eh, asumirá de hecho discusiones en torno al nuevo código de familia donde se vuelve a insistir en la necesidad de reconocer un tipo de familia distinta a la monogámica y heterosexual más tradicional y común todo esto independientemente de la existencia de nuevas eucaristías en otras denominaciones donde se incluyen a las minorías sexuales como legítimas en sus manifestaciones morales y formas de explicar y asumir su ámbito amatorio 
porque en definitiva siguen siendo excepción en la larga historia de construcción de juicios éticos sobre la sexualidad en el tortuoso devenir del judaísmo y el cristianismo dentro de la controvertida cultura occidental. del peculiar cuadro religioso cubano en tantos ellas se van caracterizando por, y cito concentración de grupos por regiones que lo es también en recursos y liderazgo repercutiendo en no pocos casos en un fortalecimiento del poder de, convo de convocatoria a nivel barrial provincial o regional algunos que despuntan exitosamente ejercen funciones incluso mucho más de lo propiamente religioso. Hablamos de la conformación de posibles barrios evangélicos en algunas zonas de este país donde el grupo emergente no logra nuclear las redes sociales, generar empleo, ofrecer servicios, ofertar actividades recreativas y trasladar a la comunidad normas que rigen el funcionamiento religioso ahora un poco contenido por la COVID, pero que puede reestructurarse después del fin de esta pandemia. Y toda esta articulación de estructuras religiosas, que no siempre están registradas y no tienen legalidad, pero sí legitimidad en ciertos espacios comunitarios, puede entender a cambiar las dinámicas de aprehensión de los religiosos hacia formas enajenantes a las tradicionales identitarias nacionales de la llamada religiosidad popular, creando quizás quintas columnas que pueden tender a la intolerancia o a la violencia contra aquellos grupos o estructuras humanas que, don, que dentro de la nación o no se correspondan a sus credos o posturas éticas, filosóficas, teologales o incluso estéticas. Por ello, en ocasión del incidente de la Iglesia Pentecostal, ya comentado precedentemente, el reverendo bautista de Venecer, Raúl Suárez Ramos, señalaba, y cito, el fundamentalismo nace como reacción dentro de las iglesias a los cambios que se estaban dando en la relación ciencia-fe e iglesia-sociedad. Y explica que se trata de sectores pro proclives a aceptar los milagros, teorías del fin del mundo, la sanidad divina, divina, perdón, la santidad absoluta de los creyentes y hasta los suicidios colectivos. Fin de la cita. Finalmente, Raúl Suárez propone que se cree una ley que regule las actividades religiosas como ocurre en otros países de América Latina. Y dice, yo estoy recopilando las leyes que tienen Argentina, Uruguay o Chile, dice Raúl Suárez, porque lo cierto es que Cuba, porque lo cierto es que Cuba solo hay una ley de asociación y que ya no es suficiente. Por consiguiente, la existencia de un cuerpo de leyes que regulen debidamente las prácticas y credos religiosos, la asunción con responsabilidad por parte del Estado de la delimitación laica de su existencia y funcionamiento, sumado a la reasunción de la educación espiritual del ciudadano como un proceso integral y no sectario podría evitar en el futuro que el fundamentalismo religioso asome con sistematicidad su oreja peluda en Cuba y podamos impedir actos tan horrendos como el suicidio ritual, el homicidio ritual, el sexo ritual, la drogación, drogadicción ritual y el terrorismo ritual, que son rasgos de algunas denominaciones que van dejando una estela de sangre y devastación paralela a la de otro fundamentalismo en el mundo de hoy. Muchas gracias. Aquí están las consideraciones generales. Luego todas las preguntas que ustedes quieran hacer al respecto. Muy bien. Bueno, eh, si alguien quiere hacer preguntas, como hemos hecho en otras ocasiones, pueden siempre mandarme las preguntas o ponerlas en el chat. 
Eh, lo mismo para los doctores Sabater Palenzuela y Barreiro Pérez, como para el doctor Maximiliano Trujillo. Entonces, yo creo que vamos a cerrar esta sesión, a menos que haya preguntas o comentarios. ¿Algún comentario <coughs> o alguna pregunta? The only comentario is that you've just removed me as chair, but that's okay. Ay, perdona, Tony. <laughs> es el funda fundamentalismo. Jeff, ¿quieres decir algo? Jeff, adelante. Thank you, thank you. I, I thought his presentation was fantastic, and I wanted to add a, a piece to both this one and the other one. Um, religious fundamentalism has also seen its way into conflicts with Afro-Cuban traditions. So these communities are now uh, quite aggressive in, in trying to convert Afro-Cubans. They're calling the police on public events. They're locking their doors. They're standing outside trying to convince people um, to leave their tradition and uh, to convert. Um, it has a very, uh, in my opinion, a very aggressive edge to it that ha is starting to be seen all over all over the island, at least from an Afro-Cuban perspective. So that aggressive edge has a race component to it, a race dimension to it. I, I, I'm sure I'm sure it does. I'm sure it does. It, it, it has a significant race component to it. And um, you, you see it, I mean, I see it in Matanzas quite often because of the way the church, their home churches are set up and where they're set up and, and how they work. So um, that's something that, that my studies believe were not as strong until recently, right? This, if this kind of movement has gone over the Caribbean, Latin America. It's also in Nigeria. Uh, this kind of Pentecostal kind of aggressive uh, religion uh, is, is started to, to see its way around the globe much more. Right. Yeah, it's, in, it's interesting, actually, that I was just contemplating that, in fact, this particular session has produced three uh, elements of, crucial elements of the whole religious picture in Cuba, and the only one that's missing is Spiritismo, and otherwise, then you've got a lot. Um, so it really was uh, a very, very full and complete and very well presented set of, of papers. So we're lucky. We have a couple of minutes before the coffee break. Anybody else want to make any comments um, or any questions that you might have for the authors of any one of the three papers? Please don't be shy. No tengan pena, por favor. I think the thought of coffee probably attracted people all of a sudden. Okay, café. Yep. Media hora de descanso. Okay, so see you in half an hour's time, which is at 4.30 or, uh, sorry, yes, 4 o'clock or 11 o'clock, depending yeah. on where you are. 4.30 or 11.30. That's the one I really meant to say. That's why <laughs> you removed me as chair. Sorry about that. <laughs> media hora, media hora, hasta ahora. <laughs>